Sprint Cup, five in the Endurance Cup that make up GT World Challenge Europe. We've been to Brands Hatch, we've still got for the Sprint Cup. Hockenheim, Valencia and Zandvoort are still to come at the end of the season. And of course, the European Championship, part of the global GT Challenge as well, that includes Australia, Asia and America. The pro category is wide open this weekend and inevitably there's an awful lot of attention surrounding Italian drivers and Italian cars. The new Ferrari 296, for example, run by Emil Frey Racing, comes here with good aero and a very good chance of a win, especially in the hands of Giacomo Altue. Uh, hopefully, yes, because it's my home race here in Misano. I'm really excited to race here, so I'm really looking forward. Uh, Brands Edge was really good, especially on qualifying, we were uh, P3 and then in the races we had some issues during the pit stop, but um, the results are promising for this race weekend and we will push to the maximum. Championship leaders after Brands Hatch, Ricardo Feller and Mattia Drudi. They come here optimistic, Audis always seem to go well around the Misano circuit, but it was a tough qualifying for race one. I think uh, the team is doing really well this year. Uh, in Spa we were as well really, really fast. Um, I think it's, uh, it's just a mix of everything. It's uh, me and Ricardo are working quite well together, I think. Also the team now, we work a lot together since a uh, couple of years as well. So it's not going to be easy uh, because of the eight in the car this weekend and also outside of the car for everyone. Uh, many cars on track. I will try to maximise what we have and try to, to keep the leading in the championship. The Misano circuit doesn't hold the best of memories for Adrian Delina. Two years ago he was here, ran wide over the sausage curves and not only damaged his car but badly damaged his back and he's hoping for better fortunes this year. No, for sure we don't have the best memories here. Um, I think it's also been a, a track that, like you said before, suits Audi and Mercedes a little bit better than us. Do you think coming in with the new car, we have a bit better of an aero package, it's suiting us a little bit better than last year. Um, so really hoping forward that we can build on what we started in Brands, Brands Hatch where we finished, we could have finished fourth, um, and hopefully build on and get some points this, this weekend. The Gold Cup is another very competitive class, looking at the young guns of international GT racing. Aurelian Panis and Alberto Di Folco are at the top of the championship after the first two races in the UK. It's a very good season and uh, I'm very proud to be here after a lot of years in Italian GT. And uh, today Aurelian made Q1, we are P12 overall and uh, P2 of God. So we are looking forward to make a good race and uh, I'm very focused and motivated because this is home race. I'm from Rome, not so far, so I'm quite happy to be here. Second in the Gold Cup, just a point behind Panis and Di Folco is the BMW, driven by Nicholas Critton and Callum Williams. It's a really close, uh, close battle so far. I mean, we've only had the one round so far at Brands Hatch for the Sprint Cup, but it's uh, looking like it's going to be a really tough fight for who's going to take top honours at the end of the year. In the Silver Cup, there's more variety in terms of the brands represented on the grid. Take, for example, the Honda NSX of Erwin Zanotti. Feeling here in Misano is fantastic. Uh, we are pushing uh, to the limit, trying to give uh, our best performance possible and uh, it's our own race, so we will be happy just to finish it, I think. <laughs> but uh, of course we want to uh, be competitive and uh, be in the fight uh, for our class. Second in the Silver Cup is Jordan Love aboard one of the many Mercedes-AMG GT3s on the grid. And he knows that two race wins here would be a real catapult in the championship to move him and Frank Bird to the top of the standings. Grand Touch was was, uh, was good for us. It wasn't the cleanest weekend. There was definitely a lot that could have been better. So, yeah, look to come to come into Misano this weekend where we are in the championship. It's nice, but yeah, we're still uh, we're still aiming for that top spot. So we got some work to do this weekend, and it's obviously still uh, still early on in the championship. So we got a clear goal, and yeah, we just want to chip away this weekend and uh, and hopefully come out on top. Two points ahead, though, in silver, the Audi of Alex Arca and Lorenzo Petresi, and Lorenzo looking good on home soil for more points. Brands Hatch, it was not easy, we had a good race one, then we struggled a bit with a contact in race two, but uh, we are very positive with Alex, uh, the lineup is uh, really good, I'm finding myself good with the car here, so should be a positive one, yeah. In bronze, another competitive car is going to be the Ferrari of Louis Machiels and Andrea Bertolini. They missed Brands Hatch, but they're out four podiums here this weekend. 
Bolzano is, is one of the best home circuit for us, for us Italians. Race here with the Ferrari, the brand new 296 is, is a dream. Uh, the weather is tough, you know, and yeah, also the atmosphere it will be a lot of people here tomorrow and Sunday. You know, in Romania, the, everyone they have uh, the motorsport in the blood, and this is good. So we are really excited to be on track. The sole female racer on the grid is the ever-improving Rima Jafari. The ex-single-seater racer is becoming a very handy GT pilot. It's my first time. It's a proper track. I mean, it really demands your attention. It's very fast, flowing, narrow at times. Um, I think my first few laps out here, I was like a bit too eager. Um, and I think that kind of is something that it catches you out. And so it is about, you know, being patient, but also making sure that you're in the right place um, on track. And I think now with a, a day under my belt, I feel like it's, it's something I, I, have, I have a good feeling. Sun is shining, grid is building, temperatures are going up. Welcome everybody to the first of two races this weekend, one today and one tomorrow within Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe powered by AWS Sprint Cup. It's going to be a really interesting race this, of course, partly to see how people cope with the heat, partly because of uh, cars accelerating through from troublesome qualifyings like silver championship leader Lorenzo Petrezzi, who was in the gravel, didn't get a time and therefore starts at the back. But so Raffaele Marciello is the man on pole position. Giacomo Altway alongside him. Enrique Chavez, bronze graded car, is third on the grid. F excellent effort by him in qualifying ahead of Fred Vervich, Nicolai Kiergaard and Loris Spinelli. Then uh, we will have Gilles Magnus, the uh, Gold Cup driver, alongside Dennis Marshall. Albert Costa lines up on the fifth row of the grid with Porsche specialist Ayn Schengouven for company. Christopher Meeks comes next alongside uh, Aurelian Panis, the gold championship leader, one win at Brands Hatch there. Lucas Legere is next alongside Jordan Love. Fabian Schiller in the FIBA Motorsport Mercedes has from Pereira for company. Norbert Siedler makes a welcome outing in Sprint Cup. And then the championship leader, Ricardo Feller, uh, is only 18th on the grid. A lot of work to do there ahead of Dean McDonald and Adam Atechi. Charles Witt, however, starts 21st. Ezequiel Perez Compank is alongside him. Then Valentino Rossi and Pietro Deli Guanti. Nicholas Critton's BMW Jim Plows Mercedes are ahead of Sebastian Bode and Robert Renard. Next on the grid will be Christopher Zirkeling in the Dynamic GT Porsche and Stephen Palette's very smart Kerb Lenegar run car. Andrea Bertolini lines up alongside Jean Baptiste Simonal. Paul Everard lines up alongside Leonardo Moncini in the Nova Race Honda. Then there is Yuki Nomoto lining up with the Singaporean driver Sean Hudsworth alongside. Adrian Delina, hoping for better fortunes than two seasons back, has Baptiste Moulin alongside him, and then Owen Zanotti and Nicola Ricitano behind. And the back row of the grid, Lorenzo Petrezzi, who didn't get a lap time in. This is the silver championship leader. He put it in the gravel on his first flying lap, and Erwin Bastard didn't get out at all because of the need for an engine chain. Uh, the cars then now come out of the kink at turn 15, short straight down to the turn 16 left-hander, which is also named Misano, and then up towards the start of race three of the season in Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Sprint Cup. Fans in the grandstand are ready. Race director gives the instruction to change the lights to green, and Raffaele Marcello blast away drama in the background. Big, big accident involving Spinelli. There's an Audi involved. We're going to go safety car straight away, I would have thought. Spinelli is off the racetrack, others litter the circuit. There's, I think Enrique Chavez is involved in that in the McLaren. Yeah, I think Chavez got hit. That spun him, turned him sharp left into the field. So we saw then the effect, the knock-on effect. So a number of cars went off in turn one. Other cars appeared to go off track, coming to the exit of turn three. So we're still waiting to see what race director is going to do as the field. And look at the field. We see one of the cars at the very back. I think that was the Lamborghini that you spotted Spinelli. So. Wow, well, uh, trying to get 42 cars into one turn and the opening lap was always going to be a test. And I think at the minute, we have to say, they didn't pass the test. Well, we did say in qualifying, the turn one, two, three S's is always a pinch point. It's also broken up the pack a bit, and I think there are others that survived it but have picked up damage. So we'll need to keep an eye on all of this, certainly to see which of the ones that are struggling at the end of the opening lap. So you're riding with Valentino Rossi, Charles Witts in the red BMW, his teammate just up the road as the cars accelerate to the end of the middle sector then. And Valentino Rossi has got a real traffic jam ahead of him. Yeah, and he's on the outside going through this kink on the back straight. He's got a car just to his right as they come down into turn 
13 into 14, then the quick flick up to turn 15, and Marcello's already got that, that sort of, you might call it comfortable, half a second advantage. Well, I think that actually um, Henrique Chavez got through that, so he is running currently in third place. So Myra in Sheargaard was the McLaren that got tagged. Dead right. It was Sheargaard who was involved in it, Loris Spinelli. Gilles Magnus was involved and Dennis Marshall involved as well. So Marcello leads Altway at the end of the opening lap. Third is Chavez, fourth is Vavish, and fifth is a gap, really, because then you've got the second battle uh, with 1.8 seconds separating fourth from fifth. Ancien Gouven is best of the rest. But, yeah, Nikolai Sheargaard did recover to be 37th. Dennis Marshall, Loris Spinelli, Gilles Magnus, the ones really involved, and Spinelli and Magnus are crawling round, possibly to the pits. Up the inside, and you get 42 cars trying to get through a very tight 4.2 kilometer, 2.6 mile circuit, and th th there's no big straight between all these 16 turns. That was Lucas Legere being bold and brave as Marcello leads across the line. Altway is second, in third is Chavez, fourth is Vavish all over him like a rash, fifth is Gouven in sixth place. Christopher Meese in the green Audi, seventh is Albert Costas Ferrari, eighth is Aurelien Panis, and he is the leading gold as Valentino Rossi gets up the inside of Robert Renard, but he can't get past the Porsche. No, he wasn't quite far enough alongside. He nearly, nearly got it done. He's going to try and make the undercut. He's tapping the back of the Porsche to settle it, and then he gets up the inside to finally, after three corners, I think he's got it done, yes, he has. And also trying to get through there, look, is the Nicholas Cruton BMW, and he's got past Robert Renner, and then Sebastian Bode in the red Mercedes, tries it and goes way, way wide, coming off the corner and drops back rather than gaining. So, 20th position for the 46 as we see the McLaren in through the pits. Right, let's try and piece it together, John. Lights will change, we go racing, but... Two McLarens nose to tail us, the second of the two McLarens suddenly it seems to get tagged. Yes, it did get tagged and literally just spun the car around into the right, into the left, and that was the beginning of what we saw. It was confusion, if not, uh, I mean, unbelievable. I mean, I can't imagine how all those cars that were spinning in the middle of the back got away with it. That's Charles Witt having a go at the Mercedes there at the inside of Jim Pla. Through he goes. So the BMW squeezes up the inside. And through goes Charles Witt, then gains ground. BMW 31, JB, Jean-Baptiste Simonard on his toes there to get past Yuki Nomoto. Nomoto, in turn, has got stuck behind Pietro Deli Guenti as they come up towards turn 16. So that queue of cars building up. And it's Petrezi who's running behind. So he's looking to find a way around the BMW to make a, maybe a more than a single pass. He's got Seminar, Nomoto and uh, Delegati, so... Oh, that was hip and shoulder. Was it ever? And Baptiste Seminar, Jean-Baptiste Seminar gains one place, nearly two. And Patricia does likewise, and he's got a gain two. The Lamborghini's got his cut down tyre. Yeah, it's got damage, so off the road and back on again, the Audi on the off the road and now crabbing. With damage is Yuki Nomoto. That's and suspension. It is, it's not a puncture, is it? It's, it's damage suspension. And also into the pit lane has come Dean McDonald, sadly. That's up on the jacks as well. The McLaren from JP Motorsports. Driver out, another retirement. Oh, Valentino, that was one to put two wheels on the grass. Coming down the straight, I'll have a look at that again. Well, he's gained a place off Lucas Legere. Has he, has he, has he? Legere stays on the outside line and goes back behind the BMW, Rossi secures the place and that moves him up into 16th spot. So on board, this is up at turn 9 and 10 as we come on to the back straight, gets us alongside, almost alongside, almost along, there's the benefit of getting a 15 onto the grass, <laughs> cuts the grass and gets alongside Leger and takes that position away. Witness Raffaele Marcello staying out. So he's the race leader and you can see the gap that he's got over there. Second, Giacomo Altue in the Ferrari. Third and fourth, a little bit closer because the bronze leading Enrique Chavez is ahead of Fred Vervich. Fifth was Gouven. Sixth, me. Seventh, Costa. Eighth is the leading goal, just going through the shot, the Audi of Aurelian Panis. There, the blue Mercedes. Second, silver of Jordan Lava. And then the third, bronze behind him is Norbert Siedler. So, pit window will be open in 18 seconds' time. Those in midfield or at the back of the queue uh, will be able to pit earlier if they need to. Now, in the majority of cases, it's in a Pro Am style car the pro that goes first, so there's no reason for them to come in other than A, maybe trying to roll the dice on strategy, and B, because they're struggling with the heat. But if you come in now, you're giving your co-driver a very long stint the other side of the window. Well, Comfort Racing are preparing to bring one of their cars in there. You see the battle that's going on. That They're diving in, and there's Ricardo Feller diving in and going to hand that car over... To Matthew Drudy. Yep, so that's going to be... A, a, that's, that's a good move, I think. 
Rossi in and also Wirtz in. So give Van Thor for Wirtz and give Maxime Martin for Valentino Rossi as much time as possible. So it's Wirtz coming in just ahead of Rossi and how well the WRT team going to manage it will very well by the looks of it. So Valentino disconnects all the bits and pieces. Maxime Martin climbs in, pulls over the shoulder strap. Valentino leans in, assists. And then the, the netting, which is mandatory now, goes back into position. The door is closed, and that's Valentino's job done here for this afternoon. And away goes Dries van Thor. Away goes Maxi Martin, who I think he's going to jump ahead, isn't he? Yes, on the pit stop. The Audi has dropped back behind both BMWs. So the uh, car that was ahead on the run into the pits, now Matteo Drudi's number 40 Audi, has fallen back behind both BMWs. Well, they're going to find a hard time getting past Maxi Martin or Dries van Thor. And that is not an ideal pit stop, uh, unfortunately, for uh, the Audi. As there, number 12, Fred Berviche gives way to. Nicholas Bart, the son of the team owner at Comtu Racing. Uh, Jean-Michel Bart, the car blasts away now, then down the pit lane. So Raffaele Marcello comes down pit lane to give way to Timor Bogoslavski, and Altway is in as well to give way to Lapalainen. So it's going to be a race in the pit lane between the Ebony Afray team and the ASP team to see, or I could say ASP team, to see who could get the. So Marcello is out, Timor Bogoslavski gets in. One set of tyres off. And let's see, a pretty shiny set of tyres going on from Bogoslowski. There's the Ferrari behind. So it came in, what, five seconds behind the Mercedes, so there'll be a little bit behind the Mercedes. It's about to roll, it is rolling. And they're still fighting with the left front of the Ferrari, so off its jacks. I think that pit stop will maybe a couple of tenths, maybe a couple of seconds even, behind the Akutas ASP team. Well, let's have a look, because they've now got that long drive all the way around the outside of turns one and two before they get to the pit out line. And so a good stop is round about the 63-second mark. And for the Mercedes, it was 65.4. And for the Ferrari, it was 67, 68, 69. Ooh. 69.5, so they've lost nearly four seconds on the pit stop. And there is our race leader, Enrique Chavez, so he must be coming in. And how long can he stay out? Surely he can't stay out much longer than this. Was there Louis Machiel's accelerates away, having taken over from Andrea Bertolini. Is that the first time they've raced the 296 this season? They ran certainly at Brands Hatch, the three at the 488. Down, a dive down the inside. McLaren stays well and yeah. truly away because they're not on the same race that makes the undercut. And yes, goes almost back ahead, but gachet has got the inside line for nine. Can't do it. Oh, Chavez, a little bit twitchy, and he's going to go deep into ten. So Gachet says, right, thank you very much. You didn't really need to fight me. I'm going through, and I'm staying through. So Bogoslowski on his first flying lap comes through to 16. Wonder, just get a glimpse and see what time that car will record. The last lap was a 2.17. That took into account Bogoslowski, 134.0. So that's his first flying lap yeah. on that new set of tyres, and I think it can only get quicker. Right, Lapalainen is second, Bart is third, and in fourth place there going through is Thierry Verbulen. In fifth place, Alberto Di Falco, and now sixth is Dries Van Thor. Car number 40 is being given a five-second time penalty. That's the championship leaders, Fella and Rudy. five-second penalty. Do we know for what? That sounds like a maybe not it's pit stop one. No? Time penalty, I suspect, is for track limits. Track limits. And that's going to be added to the race time. And another one has picked one of those up. 79. Uh, that is the Haupt Bode Haupt Mercedes. Right, Bogoslavski to Lapalina. 9.7 seconds. It's crept up a little bit. Nicholas Bart in third place. In fact, last time around, uh, Bogoslavski and Lapalina equal time. 33.517. Next lap from Bogoslavski is a 33.4. Lapalainen is about to break the beam as you look there at Patrick Niederhauser keeping Hubert Haupt to bay. And on that lap, yeah, Bogoslavski quicker than Lapalainen. So it's advantage Mercedes as Van Thor now comes up to give Alberto Di Folco a tough time. And Di Folco, remember, is the leading Gold Cup runner. You would assume that Dries Van Thor is going to find a way through. Certainly he was quicker through turns one and two. And you can see just he's got more pace. 
the Audi had to step sideways as Dries van Vogel placed the BMW in exactly the right part of the racetrack. That was just momentum on the part of Dries van Thor. He was always quicker than the Audi, and it wasn't a matter of input where that, no. that pass would, would, be, would happen. Riding on board with Maxi Martin. Look at the struggle he's got keeping that Lamborghini pointing in the right direction. Up the inside now, Maxi Martin gets the job done, or has he? Back on the inside is Pepper, retakes the place. So you run a little bit wide. Christopher House is going to make a move up the inside and gets past Maxi Martin. That was always going to be the case. House are watching those two go at it like a, a bare knuckle fight. Now he's gained that position. And Maxi oh. Martin tries to come back, and he has come back. Round the outside, that was granted a straight line, wasn't it? They rubbed going into turn one. So one up and one back for Christopher Haza. Great opportunistic dive to gain the place, but that was sheer horses that outgunned him on the pit straight. But you're right about Jordan Pepper. It's a real struggle, that Lamborghini. It does not look compliant, but now he's being saved, isn't he, by the Martin Haza battle behind him. And you've got Matteo Drudy also joining in to what was a three-way battle now for, and very shortly going to be a five, but of course, that Audi has got a penalty coming out next for five seconds that will be added to its race time. Can we have a hat tip for Miguel Ramos then? Because the very, very successful Portuguese AM or AM Plus is seventh overall. And look, he's keeping at bay Pepper, Martin, Hauser, Drudy. That's quite a roll call that he's got behind him. And he's still in seventh place overall. He's taken that car over from Enrique Chavez. But fair play, what I'm saying is he's kept it up there and kept all of those pros at bay. And he's got to get past Andrea Bertolini in the 52 Ferrari. And that's the car that might prove difficult to pass. Ramos looks to come out, get around them. That's no way. Then Jordan Love pops out as well. So everybody's looking for gaps. Everybody's trying to force somebody to make an error. Jordan Pepper in the Lamborghini on his toes to try to get through. Maxime Martin wants to try to jump him if he can. It was at this section a few laps back that we saw how nervous the Lamborghini was. But now Pepper to the inside and Ramos gives him racing room. And Maxime Martin says, yeah, I'll have that gap as well. Thank you. And Christopher Hauser, watch Hauser. He's the third car on this line. We can't quite see where he is. You look how wide he goes coming through turn 15. The Ferrari just steps aside and lets this race go through. Bertolini has been around long enough to know this is not my race. And I'm just going to let these guys go at it. Right, so their fourth is Thierry Vermeulen, and Vermeulen is keeping, as we know, one of the best GT drivers, triple Sprint Cup champion at bay. Again, nose to tail. This time, though, Vermeulen has to think about defending, and Van Thor is all over him like a rash. Inside, outside, inside, outside, inside at Quetchia. Can't do it. And damage, but... damage to the front of the BMW. Yeah. And I thought for a moment Van Mullen was going to go wide. Didn't quite happen for him now. Look behind the graphic. Here they come. Van Thor wide into nine. What's the undercut at ten? And Van Mullen is going to run wide. Here comes the BMW. This is the part of the circuit that plays to its strength. Van Thor is up the inside and Van Mullen is hung out to dry on the outside line. He's trying desperately to get back ahead on the outside line as they come to the end of the back straight. And Van Thor says, no, you don't. Go through the kink go through the corner and this time he's ahead and that secures the place job well done but he had to work for that and Vermilla might be thinking about it I'm going to come back so that was a hard work by Dries Van Thor but he made it work he did touch, touch the back of the Ferrari going into turn eight looked like the right front remember those dive plates are diving a bit more on that side than the other uh, looks not too bad actually in that shot so we're on lap 36 in this first race of the weekend for Fanatec GT there is Maxime Martin heading through turn 10. And that's for third. Right now, midway around the lap, Van Thor has caught. He's closed the second. And way out wide goes Nicholas Bart. Thank you very much, says Dries Van Thor. Easy peasy. And he's done it. Through yeah. for third place. And yeah, Nicholas Bart just offered it up on a plate. And uh, Dries Van Thor didn't need to be asked a second time. He just overran onto turn 13, 14. And uh, Dries Van Thor on it. And that off the road is the Lamborghini from the GSM team and the Lamborghini got all sideways and around it went. And that was a real tank slapper and uh, nothing to be done about it. But look, he's given it large, coming through <laughs> the gravel. So he got it pointed in the right direction and kept the thing running and had the momentum and did a good job to get off. Hopefully he didn't drag too much gravel onto the track as the consequence. Well, that's Boguslavski, your race yes, leader, yeah. who is on his way up towards the end of the race. Not put a wheel wrong in this stint. No, I think he's done an excellent job, under pressure, jumping into the car, as you pointed out, not having driven out this morning, and goes on and gives this another victory for the Akutas ASP Mercedes AFG GT3 team. Timo Bogostowski, Raffaele Marcello win race one at Misano. A great drive by the 
Italian and Russian drivers as they're the second place across the line comes Consolapa Linen, the gap at the flag, 7.4 seconds. And for third, it is going to be Dries Van Thor then. Great effort, 21st to third. Excellent, excellent effort. Proper racecraft as well. Fourth will be Nicholas Bart. Fifth, Thierry Vermeulen. And Alberto Di Falco, sixth across the line to win gold. Seventh, Jordan Pepper. Eighth, Maxi Marta. Ninth, Christopher Haza. Tenth will be Matteo Drudy on the road. Let's see where the penalty drops him to to win in silver. Frank Bird with Jordan Love comes across the line. And then the winning bronze comes home in 13th on the road. That is Miguel Ramos with Enrique Chavez. The second of the silvers should be the Mad Panda Mercedes. Yes, it's Al Manaldio and Ezequiel Perez Compank waiting for that car to get to the line. The third gold car has just gone through, says Argazo Adam Ateki. So two out of three for the Boots and VDS as they're getting some air, much needed air into the car, Miguel Ramos. But both he and Henrique Chavez, excellent job to win bronze. Well, we'll hear from the winning drivers, Rafali Marcello and Timor Bogoslavski. Victors at Masano are with Gemma. Lelo, as always, a fantastic win. You set that up nicely at the start there, keeping all the drama behind you. Yeah, it was a good clean race for us. The car, I mean, was a mega. Timur did really well, and now we, yeah, we try to focus for tomorrow. Congratulations, well done, Timur. Very quick word from you. Hot, a difficult stint, but you managed to keep a great gap. Well done. Yeah, I was just, uh, I was nervous a bit for the front left tire. Yeah, I was overheated. I think uh, that's for everyone. Yeah, because we are like at the sauna, so <laughs> I think it's the hottest round in this, GT, in this season. So, but yeah, we did a good start of the, of the first race, so yeah, we are happy. Well done, congratulations. Rafael Marcello, Timo Bogoslavski. The winners from Giacomo Alto and Consul Apolinen, Charles Witz and Dries van Thor third. Then Fred Vavish and Nick Bart ahead of Albert Costa and Thierry Vermeulen's Ferrari with Aurelian Panis and Alberto Di Falco six. The top ten completed by Front Pereira and Jordan Pepper's Lamborghini from Valentino Rossi and Maxi Martin's BMW. Lucas Legere ninth with help from Christopher Hauser and Matthew Drudi and Ricardo Feller uh, were tenth, but they have that five second time penalty. So well done, Akodis ASP, well done, Rafali Marcello and Timor Bogoslavski, who stand on the top step of the podium and now trophies will be presented. As uh, there from Daniel Ruderman, the senior manager of uh, Worldwide Security Specialist AWS. The trophies go to the drivers. Third to second and then to the winners. Giacomo Altue, very, very happy indeed. The uh, tall Italian driver. And now they've waited. They're still waiting. The team trophy to Jerome Policon and then to the winning drivers. Timo Bogoslavski takes his winner's trophy with the Masano map built to the trophy. And then Raffaele Marcello takes his uh, victors on the podium. Congratulations, Raffaele Marcello and Timur Bogoslavski, winners of race one here at Masano. It's even hotter today than it was yesterday. The grid is formed. Welcome back to Masano. Welcome to race two of the weekend in Fanatec, Fanatec GT World Challenge powered by AWS Sprint Cup. The grid decided on the time set in qualifying this morning. Dries Van Thor is going to be on pole, the first ever BMW pole in Sprint Cup, would you believe? The last BMW win in Sprint goes all the way back to 2015, uh, when it was the BMW Z4 rather than the M4. Dirk Muller and Maxime Martin were the drivers. So it's been a long time between wins in Sprint. It's been an eon in terms of a pole position, so history made in that respect. So one of the talking points over the last 24 hours has been that BOP break, which has really helped the BMWs. The other, John Watson, inevitably, is the temperature. Yes, certainly the temperature has gone off the radar. It's up six Celsius above what we had on Saturday afternoon. And I mean, those people on the grid, they must have skinned like a rhinoceros because <laughs> if they're not feeling the heat. I don't know what it is. But there is a 16 corner, 4.2 kilometer length Mizano circuit and coming down to the bottom end of the circuit then there's return back to start finish straight and a lap time in qualifying in the high one minute 30s in the race expect to see something probably in the low one minute 32s maybe somebody might get quick but nobody's going to get anywhere near the lap record set by Dries Van Thor some years ago 
When he was an Audi driver, there on the grid is the pole car in the flat cap. To the left of it is uh, Vincent Voss and Dries with uh, the umbrella there to try and keep some of the temperature and the sunshine off the car. Some of the cars have an air conditioning system, some don't. Uh, and uh, at the moment, it's keeping the cars cool and keeping the drivers cool. The one positive for them all is that this is a sprint cut round, so pretty much a maximum of half an hour in the car. But even that, certainly for the AMs, is very, very tough. Yes, and some of the cars are better equipped. Some of the brands are better equipped to deal with. Certainly, we know that the 88 Mercedes that won yesterday, they have got a separate air conditioning unit within the car as opposed to the air conditioning that would come with the car if you went and bought it out of your Mercedes showroom. And that weighs an extra 10 kilograms. But, 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 because they're already carrying a 50 kilogram, uh, they have to take it. So they, they, they're not, the net, net, net is they've still 50 kilograms of ballast. Let's go to the grid. Valentino Rossi with lots of fans supporting him is with Gemma Scott. Valley, it's always amazing to see so many of your fans here screaming as you come out of the pit onto the onto the garage here and onto the the, the, the grid here, still crowding around. How does that feel for you? Ah, it's uh, it's always great. The the support is uh, is special, and the race here in Misano is uh, really really our home uh, home Grand Prix, so it's always special. Yesterday we did uh, we did a good race, so we have uh, we have a good pace. This morning Max uh, put the car uh, in uh, in the third position, so we have. Um, a lot better starting starting position, so we can do another type of race, and uh, we see. And of course, you know, great qualify, qualifying as well today. A fantastic crowd ahead of us to cheer you on at the start, with to cheer Max on at the start. You'll be taking the second stint. Coping with the heat, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Max is always very fast, and uh, he will do the first the first half. Uh, will be very hard with the, with the hot because really the temperature is out of control. <laughs> yeah. But uh, like this, with all the people racing in front of all the crowd, uh, is uh, is a lot better. You have more fun. Enjoy it. Thanks yeah, a lot, Ali. Ciao. Ciao. And that was the reaction a few moments ago when he stepped out onto the grid. Still in civvies rather than in overalls, so temperature uh, managed quite well. And uh, the Masano circuit management delighted to see him. And how about that for a reaction? Not many GT drivers get that. No, I mean, he's a remarkable competitor on two wheels, now on four wheels. So the fans are there. There you can see the blue and yellow with the 46 number synonymous from his motorcycling days, MotoGP and all that came before. And of course, he raced here. This racetrack, of course, is known as the Marco Simoncelli Autodromo, named after the legendary Italian motorcyclist Marco Simoncelli, tragically, who lost his life some years ago. Let's go back to the grid. Gemma is keeping busy down there. Who have we got now, Gemma? Dries, it's been great to see the improvement of the BMW throughout the course of this weekend. I know the balance of performance was changed yesterday after the quali. The race pace was incredible. Perfect spot right now. Yeah, it looks good, huh? No, <laughs> um, yeah, man, we, we, are, we are starting from the best position possible, so now we have to execute again a good race for us, uh, make sure the team does a good job. Me and Charles, we do the best job we can. Uh, I'll try to make a, a biggest gap as possible to, to make Charles his life a bit easier. It will be tough. I think the Audi is very fast. Uh, it will be close. It will be a close battle, I think. Um, it will be hot. We will have to save the tyres a lot. Um, let's see. It will be interesting. There's a lot of fans here for your teammates as well that are cheering in the background. Yeah, but, but uh... it was because 32 was sold out. That's why I took 46. <laughs> I love it. Have a great one. Thanks a lot, Dries. So, Dries Van Thor, the man that's going to start on pole position having made history with this uh, first uh, Sprint Cup pole for BMW. Uh, further back on the grid, Audis always go well around here, and we know that the likes of Christopher Hauser, Fred Verveesh, and certainly Patrick Niederhauser from the front row will be up there. Well, undoubtedly, Patrick Niederhauser will be a real threat to the two BMWs, two BMWs in the top three, so he'll be looking to try and get a jump into turn one. So, as you look there at the Hauser Leisure car, let's rejoin Gemma on the grid. Patrick, qualifying was very exciting this morning, seeing you top and then drop and then top, but fantastic to see the Audi here on the front row. And traditionally, Audi have had a brilliant history here at this circuit. Yeah, I think it's a very good circuit for us, for sure. Uh, obviously, I was hoping to, to uh, snatch out Paul today. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't really quite make it. Uh, Dreesy did a fantastic job, obviously, but uh, I'm very happy still to be on the front row. Uh, it was a tough day yesterday, so... Uh, Better, better starting position now. How are you coping with the heat? Have you got a cooling system within the car? No, nothing. So it's, it's going to be uh, pretty hot. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, enjoy. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you.
Patrick Niederhauser, DTM racer these days, as well as uh, in Fanatec GT. And he's about to get suited and booted. Of course, he's already warm in his overalls. There's the balaclava, there's the hands device and the helmet and the gloves, and then you get into a hot car and get strapped in. So whatever the temperature feels like now, it's about to probably double. Well, I think within the field, we've got 42 cars, which is, by my calculations, 84 drivers, of whom some will be uber fit, uber prepared, your diet, training, whatever. And then there will be those that are not at that same level, and they will be the drivers in particular cars that will suffer greatly. I mean, Patrick Niederhauser, when you look at him, he's as lean as a greyhound, and I would imagine he, whatever his stint's going to be, 25 or to 35 minutes, will not really struggle at all, but he'll be a, a real challenge to BMW. Now, yesterday's winners, Timur Bogoslowski, Rafael Marciello. Timur starts, Lelo is with Gemma. <laughs> Lelo, I just saw you talking to Mattia. Were you wishing him a happy birthday? Yeah, it's his birthday. We are speaking for tonight. We go party together. So, yeah. <laughs> the most important plans to be yeah. made on the grid before the race. Yeah, yeah it's hot, so we, have, we need a bit of champagne. So let's hope we go on the podium. Yeah. Absolutely. How's Timor coping with the heat? He's, he's suffering, but I mean, it's, uh, it's his problem, not mine. I mean, uh, I told him, like, just brief, and, and yeah, it's 25 minutes for him normally, so he should be okay. Well, you go and jump in an ice bath before your stint. Thanks, Leno. Have a good Thank one. <laughs> so relaxed. That's teamwork for you. It's his problem, not mine. Yes, I mean, I think he sums it up probably succinctly. And, I mean, Timo is, is a, a different you know, build to Rafael Marcello. And part of the preparation is, in these conditions, it's, first of all, stay out of the sun. In my view, eat sensibly, eat lots of fruit and vegetables because get your hydration that way mm. rather than gulping down loads of fluid because all you do when you drink loads of fluid, it goes straight through your system and you pass it on. So you want to take on fluid, but take it on in a way where you retain the fluid and rather than dispensing of it. So uh, I think Marcello knows all that. Maybe for Timo, he's not quite so educated in those areas. Now there is one of the blowers to try and get some cool air onto the driver. Every little helps, even if that's... Not the coolest of air, but at least it's something circulating. And uh, you're looking at the Emil Frey Racing Ferrari, Consul Apollinen's car fourth on the grid, and Thierry Vermeulen seventh on the grid. So uh, both of them were fairly rapid this morning, and uh, the Italian cars, as much as Italian drivers, have lots of support as well. So doors open. The JP Motorsport McLarens with reflective paint on the roof rather than a matte colour. That's Another way that one or two of the teams uh, address this problem of trying to keep the heat away from the car. Right, the fans have no such problems. T-shirt and shorts, vests and shorts, and uh, they're strapped into one, five, nine. Good to go is Benjamin Goethe. His uh, brother Oliver had a great win in Formula 3 at Silverstone last week at the Grand Prix. But uh, Benjamin has gone the GT route. Oliver Gerser, of course, their dad, a uh, sports car racer as well. So, grid is clearing. It's going to be one lap, of course, behind the, as it turns out to be, the pace car, the leading car. Uh, that will dive for the pit lane and then we'll be in business. We've made the point about the fact that it's a busy grid, 42 cars. It is a record, beating an earlier record, which was quickly from Misano. Yesterday, pitch point, turn one, incident, we got away with it, though. Sort of got away with it. There were four cars involved in that incident. Three of them more or less retired after a lap or whatever. Bodywork damage, suspension damage. Let's hope that we can get a clean start. But look, if you've got 42 cars on the grid, to get them all through that bottleneck into turn one, then the transfer back to turn two, it's a big ask. And of course, those at the back of the field will be traveling faster than those at the front of the field when you get into the braking zone. So you get this sort of effect, you know, motorway effect of everybody at the back piling into those in front. Hopefully, hopefully we'll avoid that this afternoon and get everybody through the field cleanly. So cars leave the line. This is the order. Dries van Thor on pole position with Patrick Niederhauser alongside him. Maxime Martin is third and Consul Lapaline is fourth. Christopher Hauser and Simon Gachet share the third row ahead of Thierry Vermeulen and Matthew Drudy. Thomas Neubauer and Benjamin Goethe locked out row five after qualifying. Then it's Timo Bogoslowski on the sixth row. Work to do. Christian Engelhart the same alongside him in the Porsche. Then you've got Callum Williams and Nicholas Bart ahead of Jordan Pepper and Cesar Gazzo. Uh, out of the silvers, the class pole there to Nicola Malinangeli, and alongside is the Gold Cup Audi Alberto Di Folco. Then Alex Arca lost the Silver Cup Championship lead yesterday to Frank Bird and Jordan Love. They're alongside. Then it's Mattia Michelotto and Jesse Salman Alfio. On the 12th row of the grid, you've got Diego Di Fabio and then Dimitri Gavatsova in the Lamborghini. Miguel Ramos is on row 13. Marcus Pavarud lines up alongside, and then it's Finley Hutchison 
and Patrick Kropinski on row 14. Row 15, Jacopo Guidetti and former Grand Prix racer Christian Klein ahead of Hubert Haupt and Alex Malikin. Next comes Marco Casara and Gregoire de Mustier, quite a long way back, ahead of Ralph Bowen and Alessio de Leda. Then Rima Aljafali to line up on the 19th row with Andre uh, Bukas of the company. And then it is Philippe Zaga and Louis Machiels on the penultimate row, ahead of Eric Dabar and then Fidel Castillo at the very back of the grid. So that is the order uh, after yesterday's race. The overall championship lead now to Rafale Marcello Timo Bogoslowski by 10.5 points over Mattia Drudi and Ricardo Feller with Wits and Van Fall third. Gold still being led by Defolco and Panis. Second, Callum Williams, Nicholas Crutton, and uh, whatever, uh, Simon Gachet third. In silver, Frank Bird and Jordan Love are now ahead by six points from Petrezzi and Arca third, Pavel de Moulin, and in bronze, and we didn't have any bronzes at Brand, so basically it's the result of yesterday. Uh, Enrique Chavez, Miguel Ramos lead from Alex Malikin and Anshin Guven second, Patrick Kropinski, Christian Klein now in third. So, the cars get themselves into formation. We are set to go racing then, and uh, the drivers know that the heat is going to be a factor. Track limits are always a factor around here as well. Miguel Ramos, you're riding with him, was struggling towards the end of his stint yesterday. He did the second stint and looked absolutely done in when he got out of the car. But uh, he will go first today. Maxime Martin with a lot of hopes, a lot of pressure on his shoulders. It's a bit like Brands Hatch, this, in a sense. Qualified well. Now he's got to keep the car up there for Valentino Rossi to preserve the place in stint two. Well, he's starting on the second row of the grid, so he's got a very good opportunity to do so. But as we're talking, the track temperature is just continuing to creep. It's now at 57.2. I mean, I don't know how long it's been before we get to the magic 60 Celsius track temperature, which is absolutely unbelievable, certainly in Europe. And, uh, well, just wonder whether the drivers are going to make it through. I suspect 99% of them will do. If there will be one or two, will suffer. Hopefully, they'll be able to get in and out of the car, or mainly getting out of the car when it comes to the driver change between 25 and 35 minutes into this race. Which is about to start. Race two at Masano in the sunshine in high temperatures is go. Green light goes on and a great start by Van Thor. Martin switches side to go to the outside of Niederhauser. Van Thor weaves around to try and defend on the run to turn one. Niederhauser back up the inside of Martin. Retakes second place then. And Consolapa line in the Ferrari tries to squeeze up to fourth, but Christopher Hauser says, No, you don't. There are others that skip the entry to turn two by running wide at turn one. But it's BMW in the lead, and Van Thor has done exactly what he needed to do. He's converted pole into the lead. Yes, he had a, when he was on it, really, before one of the lights went out, but he got the advantage of that pole position. The rest of the field is streaming through turn four or five, then cutting back to the left through six. Pretty much everybody in the field has managed to get through. OK, some have been a bit wider. You can see this coming through turn six. The Mad Panda Mercedes railway wide. But all the cars appear to be running, and we're happy around the opening lap. All hires for the moment further back, also on Timor Bogoslowski. Here he is to see what progress can be made. Now, ahead, you've got the Lamborghini there, the VSR car. So I rather fear that Bogoslowski has dropped rather than gain over the opening few corners. But let's count him across the line at the end of the lap and see. So there's an Audi in the background getting crowded up towards the grass there. For second place, look, Niederhauser and Martin go absolutely toe to toe out of turn 12. BMW on the outside line, Audi on the in. Niederhauser goes through, Martin will look for the switch back. There's no gap going up to the hairpin though, because exactly where Maxi Martin needs to be, there is an Audi parked on his line. Absolutely, I mean, that was good defence from Niederhauser, but very good attack from Maxi Martin all over the back of Niederhauser, and he's also being challenged by again. Look how close these three cars are coming along to start with. It's great to complete one lap. So Dries Van Thor trying to build that lead over Patrick Niederhauser, and it's working for him because he leads at the end of lap one by 1.4 seconds. Through in third place, Martin. Fourth is Hauser. Fifth, Lapaline. And Vermeulen is up to sixth. Seventh is Drudy. Eighth is Neubauer. Simon Gachet has dropped back into ninth. Benjamin Goethe is tenth up to eleventh. Jordan Pepper and down to twelfth is Bogoslowski. An effort being made in the background, look by the McLaren of Benjamin Goethe up on the inside of Gachet. And he's gone through. We've also got a yellow flag in the last sector. So the McLaren gets through cleanly. Uh, the loser of that, you said, you point out Bogoslowski. But give him a little bit of time to settle in. There was always going to be a tough starting position in that sort of middle part of the grid but look everybody's side by side all and there is the 81 mercedes that got turned around and that unfortunately was rima rima jafali yeah, the back yeah. of the field she's got going again but a lot of time lost 
as the pack swarms its way up through turns 9 and 10. And in fact, I think Trafali's got damage because the car has gone very slowly down to turn 1, as though there's either a puncture or suspension problems, and it's just got all sideways going through the first sequence of corners. So Trafali has damage, clearly, and he's limping round of the pit lane as the pack streams up through turn 12. 54 Porsche there, Christian Engelhart 13th ahead of Callum Williams in the BMW. Another of the WRT run cars that's looking for a gap on the inside, but there's no way through there. No, all three BMWs, all four BMWs are all running competitively. There is the battle that's going on for second place. You can see third, fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way back to Thomas Nearby in eighth position. Simon Gashi behind them. Benjamin Cody dive on the inside. But fortunately, nobody made a move. But uh, we've all got through. So down towards turn one, dives number 31 BMW there. That's being the car of Thomas Neubauer. The two Ferraris from Emil Frey have got themselves together. Constant up a line and with Terry Vermeulen tucked up behind him. Thierry's father, of course, Max Verstappen's manager. But Dries van Thor led last time by 1.3 seconds, meaning that Niederhauser was a little bit closer. And almost three abreast there coming up towards turn four through on the inside line goes Nicholas Bart in the blue and white Audi. Great racing going on here as Christian Kleen is in that mix as well. We've just had a pit stop from Simon Gachet, the Audi that was crowded onto the grass on that opening lap. Well, we can barely catch my breath. I mean, it's not anything to do with the heat, it's just the, the action is frantic. So there is the Silver Cup battle for first place with the Ferrari leading from the Audi. So 99 is Alex Arca, who lost Lots of lap times for track limit abuses in qualifying. Going nicely now, uh, trying to get onto the tail of Nicola Marinangeli. Then he can attack for the Silver Cup lead and try, in the course of this, to assert himself again in the championship, especially with Frank Bird and Jordan Love, the category leaders in the standings, being only third in the race at the moment. There is the attempt to run Audi. Alex Arca's dad, Arkin Arca, is the man behind that team. The leader coming up towards the end of the lap. Now, let's see whether Niederhauser is able to maintain that progress. I suspect not, looking at the sectors. On this lap, I think Van Thor will have been able to break away a little bit as the cars now make the run up towards the line. Well, Van Thor will be delighted to have the idea between himself and his sister car because it's allowing him to increase that gap of 1.6 seconds as they come across start finish line. So, Chris Van Thor, it's the perfect start. He's got nobody to concern himself either behind or certainly ahead of him, so he can take his own line, he can drive at his own pace. Uh, Callan Williams also, he's improved, now got ahead of Christian Engelhardt, up to 12th position, so BMW is doing pretty well, all four. So Bogoslavski in 11th place, and ideally for that team, there would be a safety car towards the end of Timor stint, or the start of Rafaelis, to really bring that car back into the mix, because Timor Bogoslavski is already 8.7 seconds back off the race leader, and that margin potentially will stretch further over the course of the stint, as Van Thor has got clear space around it. Bogus Lasky, busy defending, of course. Yes, but he's got a, a directly ahead of him, he's got Jordan Pepper and the Lamborghini, and that is no walk in the park. Jordan Pepper drove extremely well yesterday in defence with a car that looked like it was really a bucking Bronco at one point. It was hard to see how he's going to keep the car in control, but he did, and finished the race strongly. Still the leading Ferrari, Nicola Marinangeli, ahead of Alex Arca there, number 10 is the Gold Cup Audi of Cesar Gazzo, GT4 graduate. It's another of the Boots and VDS cars. Quick, but not able yet to find a way past Arca. The Ferrari versus the grey Audi then. These two, first and second, within silver. Great fight going on between the two, but Nicola Marinangeli has the advantage for the moment. Runs wide out of 15, though. But Alex, Alex Arca is trying. You can see running very wide, coming out of 15, trying to get himself into position, not close enough now, going down the start finish straight to do anything but just using the car to put it into the mirrors of the Ferrari and trying to build to make a move maybe up into turn four and five. But again, the gap between the Ferrari and the Audi is probably just too much for that to be a realistic overtake. So Van for 1.6 seconds to the good. Boguslavski not catching Jordan Pepper for 10th. And Nicola Marinangeli not escaping from Alex Arca, is he? So this 14th, 15th place battle for the silver class lead. Absolutely nose to tail. Bit of damage on the back of the Audi. Uh, so, uh, oh, oh. I think how there isn't damage to the back of these cars is beyond me. You can see their bodywork on the right rear trailing. I don't think it's going to be an issue particularly. But I mean, Alex Arca has got, he's got Cesar Gazoo all over the back of him. And then you're behind that, you've got De Falco and, the, and another Audi. So three Audis all nose to tail, 15 through 17. 
So there is the leader, Dries Van Thor, last time. 1.6 seconds to the good he was as he comes now down towards uh, turn 12. Behind him is Patrick Niederhauser up holding Audi Honor ahead of Maxime Martin. Then fourth, Christopher Hauser. And in fifth place, Constant Apollinen with sixth, Thierry Vermeulen. So you've got two Ferraris, two Audis, two BMWs within the top six. But it's the number 32 that's getting the, the, the advantage was 1.6 seconds the end of lap four it's going to be probably a fraction more and Niederhauser has managed to do something which maybe he didn't anticipate and that was pull away from Maxime Martin so the gap is now 1.8 between first and second and Maxime Martin doesn't seem to have anything to, to challenge that second place Audi and, and likewise in fourth place Christopher Hauser who was looking strong in the opening two laps again has now found his pace and it's either the pace that the BMW is running at or that's it so there is Hazer, who runs out of turn five now. Short straight towards the left that brings you onto the back straight down towards the long left of Kretje. Battles further down the order here as well, coming into turn one, including number 18, Lamborghini of uh, Fidel Castillo, new to the championship this weekend, and he's got the uh, Porsche of Philip Saga around him. And also in that mix is another of the Lamborghini, as you can see at the head of this queue, number one, two, six, the white Lamborghini, Dimitri Kvatsova. That car didn't really get much running yesterday because of being involved in the incident in the first corner, but Kvatsova has been very quick in Lamborghini Super Trofeo. His co-driver, Loris Spinelli, finally, we start to see him in GT3 racing because he's won pretty much all there is to win in Lamborghini Super Trofeo. In bronze, however, at the moment, the class is being led by Hubert Haupt in that red uh, Mercedes just gone out of shot. Second is Gavatsova and third the Porsche of Alex Malikin. So wait for the cars to come back into view. There is the category leading Mercedes, the Lamborghini behind, and then third there, Alex Malikin. So the cars are together on track for the class fight. Yeah, I mean, it's very much over to spin for the Mercedes 87. Who's behind the world? That was just a turn eight. Eric Debar, I don't know what he did, whether that was an assist or whether that was just down to him. But that's the tale of that incident. We may get a replay of it a little later. In the meantime, purple sectors are popping up in the leading cars, but not necessarily the lead car itself. No, because Lapalainen has done a purple, and so is also Maxi Martin. This fight still for silver continues. Marin Angeli, 14th ahead of Arca, and Frank Bird, third in silver, has just dropped off the back of that little train a bit, but he is hustling on, trying to catch. Alberto Di Folco, the leading gold at the moment is Callum Williams in BMW number 30, and Hubert Hampton, as I say, is the leading bronze. Now, there is the run down towards turn seven, and uh, you can have a look in replay at what went on. Alex Arca coming out of turn 15, very, very wide indeed, trying to go all the way around the outside of the Ferrari, which doesn't really give him a lot of room to get back on. No, and I think he was nearly on the beach. I hope he took his beach towel with him, but certainly way, way off the racetrack, but not in a position to do anything about challenging the Ferrari. And rightly so, the Ferrari and Marian Gallic holds his ground. Alex Arca has got to back off and try and slot in, but there's another Audi there trying to swoop through, and he just about gets himself back in. So that was Cesar Gazzo who was thinking about, will I be forceful? He did the right thing and let Arca get back into line. And Aka is still pushing, he's working the tyres hard. So in these temperatures, a lot of the uh, teams like the Audi or Lamborghini teams will go for a little bit less camber, so they don't use the tyres quite so hard, they don't overheat the tyres. And it's silver right now, it's Marin Angeli versus Aka. Nicola Marin Angeli leads then as they come out of the last corner, a hop and a skip over the kerb behind them there for Alberto Di Folco, who is catching his teammate, and that's for second and third in gold. I mean, wherever you look, in every category, there are groups of three or four cars fighting. There we see the silver Ferrari leading, uh, but Alex Aka all over the back of him, and he's tried every trick in the book. And uh, even being that far off at the exit of turn 15, I wondered if he was ever going to return to the racetrack, but he did. Yeah, he didn't have to pay to get back in, but it was close as the uh, cars now come once more out of turn six down the fast back straight in the background. Frank Bird being caught by uh, Mattia Michelotto, Italian GT regular, and the two gold cup fighting Audis. They're going through shots. There's Argazzo ahead of Alberto Di Folco, the two teammates. Golden rule is, of course, don't tangle with your teammate. They're not doing so yet. They're close as Alex Arca again lines up for a go against Nicola Marinangeli, but to no avail. I mean, he's certainly giving the Ferrari a workout, but likewise, he's got to be careful because he himself is under pressure from Cesar Gauzo. Gauzo's just sitting back waiting 
to see whether Alex Aka goes a little bit off message and tries to throw it down the inside. But the Friars quick down the straight, managed to pull a little bit of a lead. Gaz, who's very close to the back of Alex Aka, as they come down into turns 13 and 14. A little bit more respectful of track limits this time by all three drivers. Up front, Dries Van Thor leading Patrick Niederhauser and then Maxime Martin in third place. The lead gap is now over two seconds. And of course, another element to factor in, speed of pit stops, because in the overall gold and silver contest, they can be a natural pit stop, as quick as you can. They're not done to a time. They are in bronze, but not in the other classes. And we know how good WRT is in the pit. So an advantage that number 32 BMW has now could be stretched even further with a good pit stop. Oh, catch my breath. It's exhausting as driving. Gap now 2.1 seconds, first to second place. And the top, well, the top four have more or less settled into a pace. The only car that may be looking to make a bit of progress would be the fifth place, because of Lapalainen and Ferrari, who's only nine tenths of a second behind Christopher Hauser. But uh, otherwise, top four gaps roughly a second between all four. Patrick Niederhauser has just done an absolute best first sector. Uh, not significantly quicker than Dries Van Thorpe, but it indicates that he's still pushing, pushing, pushing. And uh, Maxime Martin is still in third place. There's also a battle for sixth. Look, Thierry Vermeulen in the head of Matthew Drudy. Here they come into turn 12. Now, remember that yesterday, because it was a poor qualifying and not a great result for them, uh, Drudy and Ricardo Feller, his co driver, lost the championship lead in sprint. Uh, so they come into this with a second and a first and a tenth as their result. So they need to try and get a, a good haul here to fight back against Bogoslowski and Marcello. And off the road there has got Marco Casara, but he's dug himself out the gravel. Yes, yeah, so that's up at turn nine and ten and shard the racetrack with gravel, but hopefully everybody will manage to avoid it. As we look at this battle again, third, fourth, fifth, the few Ferraris of the gaps opened up considerably between Lavalan and, and uh, Vermullen. So it's now two and a half seconds, fifth to sixth. But the lead gap is up to 2.2 seconds, despite the efforts of Patrick Niederhauser. And uh, there you can see Vermeulen versus Drudy, the two of them still squabbling as they come up now towards turn 14. And there, all self-induced, was Kassara. Yeah, it was a bit of a pendulum effect. Back end of the Porsche got loose, and once it's broken traction, then he was just going to sit there and wait till the car came to a stop. Luckily, he got it rolling when he got the back wheels into the gravel. Remember the Porsche engine, I keep telling you, sticks out over the back of the rear wheels, so traction is pretty good. So he drives out of the gravel, he returns to the circuit, and Casarau drops down the order as a consequence of all of that, as the lead gap is hovering around the 2.2 seconds mark. Niederhauser, though, has not given up. He's done another uh, good first sector, fractionally faster than Dries Van Thor. And in the second sector, Van Thor is by an even narrower fraction the quicker. Now that is Dimitri Gavatsova's Lamborghini, which might have a problem. Let's see, he tried to get past Finley Hutchison up the inside. Hutchison tries to close the door. Contact between the two, damage to the Audi. Yeah, the right rear, you can see bodywork rubbing on the tyre as a consequence. So two drivers looking for track space, that really was space for one. So both drivers will come off the worst for that uh, overtake attempt. And so now the cars work their way through uh, lap number, in this case, 10. You're looking at the sort of midfield and back battle. The leaders have just started lap 11. One, one, two there is the JP Motorsport McLaren in the hands of Patrick Krupinski, team owner. And he's squabbling with the green Audi of Gregoire de Bustier. Ralph Bourne in the Porsche is on the back of that gang as well. And Krupinski going after De Leder in the Audi. Something's happened to Alex Arca. He's lost two positions You're right. in the last oh. lap and a bit. Oh, oh. bodywork. And... Krupinski had a dive up the inside of Alessio De Leder. Contact is the result. They both spin. And Krupinski tries to get the McLaren back in the right direction. De Leder likewise. Goodness me. Wow. But well. McLaren's got damage, look. And certainly got damage. Crabbing. Suspension damage. The car is crabbing and there's the Ferrari. Oh. That's for Silva, four wide, and into the lead of the class suddenly goes Frank Bird. The Audis get together, and off goes one of the Gold Cup Audis at high speed into the barriers and into the gravel. So that all kicked off coming out of turn six, and through it all into the lead of the class has come Frank Bird. Nicola Marinangeli was forced out wide, and he lost time. But there, look, back at the races is Alex Arkin, second in class. But I rather fear we might have an interruption here with a car in the wall and another one parked by the side of the circuit. That's Krupinski, he's out. Yes, the McLaren's out. The Audi clearly is out because it went off, hit the barrier on the outside of the exit of turn six. So whether we are going to see a full Porcello. Yes, we are. Okay. It's coming in 20 seconds time. 
Oh, time to catch breath, but great opportunism by Frank Bird. But what, four abreast, weren't they? They were, and the most important thing was to me on the inside, on the exit of turn six, not on the outside. This was just what ultimately oh, lands with that idea being spat out off the racetrack. There you can see the damage to the racetrack. Goodness knows how much damage has done to the number nine Audi. And that was Alberto De Falco behind the wheel of that car. He was making also good progress. That progress is now all over. Well, De Falco came into this race with Aurelien Panis as the uh, goal the championship driver is leaders. Okay. With uh, two wins out of the three races. So we've gone full course yellow. And there is Dries van Thor, the race leader. Now, for the moment, of course, everyone has to go at this Delta pace. But... I think this will be quite a lengthy full course yellow and we'll end up going safety car. I think we will do because the the tyre barrier that DeFalco's already hit has been split and uh, it may take some time for that to be reinstated. Uh, let's get a look at the wide angle lens. We can't quite see it. It was off at that point. You can just see the black marks on the blue painted bit of the racetrack where the Audi went off and it went off pretty quick. That was a big hit for Alberto De Falco. He will, there it is. So you can see how much damage has been done to the tyre bales and I suspect that will take a few minutes to get back in place. The car will be removed quickly. That's not a problem. But uh, all over for Alberto De Falco. Broken rear suspension you can see as well as all the bodywork damage. The car quickly, as you say, can be craned away and uh, the marshal's very rapidly on the scene with the recovery team there to get the Audi out of the gravel bed but then uh, you need the Misano staff to come and attend to that tyre wall Patrick Kroprinski's McLaren that was damaged in that earlier tangle we were looking at one and the second one kicked off uh, he's out of the car, the McLaren is out of the race real shame that because he was going nicely uh, earlier on in the race so uh, all of a sudden big drama. Yes we didn't have a full course yellow yesterday we had a cleanish race but uh, the racing was so intense all the way through all the categories all the way down to the what was now we've got we've got well it's going to be 37 cars remaining because de falco's out kabruski's out de bar's out uh okay the 126 just looking down timing and scoring to see what that is that's also what the Aperiali racing uh, lamborghini and of course rima jafal in the mercedes was out pretty much on lap two so let's try and piece various incidents together. So the first one that we looked at was this dive by Patrick Kuprinski up on the inside of Alessio de Leda. Contact made between the two, bits of bodywork dislodged and they both spin. Then up into position goes Alberto Di Folco. He gets hip and shouldered out by Nicola Maranangeli. That's what triggered it all. Di Folco on the inside, Cesar Gazzo on the outside. Di Folco didn't like that. He squeezes Marin Angeli, who goes way wide. Look at the blue Mercedes from the back of the queue. All four wheels off the road. Track limits. <clears throat> and four abreast, but then something gives. And the Audi's tangle. In fact, it was the two teammates touching, and DeFolco was the one that came off. I first. mean, just as fair, the car literally went from being on the racetrack, spat off the racetrack, off to the rider. Right, nothing that Alberto DeFolco could do about that. Just carrying too much speed, probably doing well in excess of 200 kilometers an hour when that contact took place. So this is De Falco's view. Wait for the nudge. Gets he pincered. Was, yeah, he was simply the meat in that Audi sandwich. So Alberto De Falco off the racetrack, through the gravel, into the tar barrier. And this in super slow-mo. Safety car procedure. With Kroprinski on the inside of De Leda. I don't think De Leda really knew he was there because he, he squeezes, it seems, Kroprinski up towards the kerb and Patrick Kroprinski loses the back of the McLaren. You see the damage done to the car, bits fly, and by that stage, they both spin. We've gone safety car, incidentally, now, as you look at the replay. So that's the incident that completed one lap, and we're now going to go under safety car conditions, and there is the safety car on track, picks up race leader for second and third, and what we've got, 38 minutes of this race remaining, is another three minutes before the pit lane will open, and of course, under safety car conditions, pit lane opening will be postponed, most likely. Uh, Nicola Marinangeli, who has just gone from the lead to fourth in silver, has also got a five second hold, a penalty at the pit stop for track limit violations. So it's going from bad to worse with it. Well, I don't know whether that was when he came out of turn six, he was again, or somewhere else around the lab. We didn't get that particular information when the incident actually was uh, registered. Nevertheless, it's a five second pit stop. Addition. 
Well, that might be one of them. There's a sort of totting up process, isn't there? But you get three, and then there's a driving standards flag, and then your fourth uh, gets you a warning, and then you, you creep up the scale to a penalty. So, uh, rather frustrated drivers in uh, that of cars. So, towards the timing line comes the safety car. Maxime Martin is the man in third place. And, uh, making sure the tyres are still at the right temperature, ready for the restart. Heading now in towards turn one. But the reason now that we are under caution is so that tyre barrier can be repaired before we go racing again. So, sitting on board, the 46 BMW, and just while you're running behind the safety car, albeit the safety car is driving probably pretty much safety car in. Well, that's interesting. They've done a very good job at reinstating that tyre barrier. Safety so car coming in at the end of this lap, so we yeah. go back Between racing the mid lane with the movements. So safety car in at the end of this lap. That's been confirmed to the teams on the screen. You just heard the race director Alain Adon saying that the pit window is delayed by one minute. So uh, they'll have to factor that in. But we'll go back racing at the end of this lap. So that was the incident corner. The cars turn through, and uh, Van Thor, Niederhauser, Martin remains the top three. But of course now they're all bunched up, so there are one or two drivers that are going to have to be real heroes on the restart to try to gain ground. Yeah, so I suspect that the lead four cars, maybe the lead six cars, even the lead seven cars, or even the lead eight, or even, unless you run it up to the top ten. <laughs> I mean, how many of those top ten cars are going to come in? Because they've mostly got their, you know, their, their pro driver on board, and they'll get to complete this lap, and then the safety car will go into the pits, then they'll get one more lap and that at that point. Uh, that should take us to that additional minute, and the pit lane should be open. They're going through is Callan Williams, who's been the bravest through the Turn 11 kink at Covone, 238 kilometres an hour. And uh, now the field's starting to bunch up because Dries Van Thor has slowed the pace, ready to accelerate away on the restart. The pace car, the safety car, heads for the pit lane. It's up to Van Thor now to control the pace. Niederhauser has one last chance, if you like, before he dives for the pit lane and it's helped by the safety car. This has also helped Bogoslavski and Marcello because he brings them a little bit closer to the pack ahead. Now there, car running wide and almost a bit of overlapping. You can't overtake it until you get to the line, but with one car running rather wide, that almost tripped up the pack behind. Look back from Bogoslavski's car. He has got Callum Williams behind him. Bogoslavski needs to be on the attack, but it's Williams attacking him. Yeah, he, Bogoslavski was trying to find a way past the Lamborghini and now he's got Callum Williams all over the back. So Bogoslavski probably lost fractionally going into turn 16, and that's, I think, the reason why we've got Callum Williams right on the tail of the 88 Mercedes. But there's an Audi that's gone wide there, look, so a place gained by Timor Bogoslavski. Cars now come to the back straight, down towards Kretschia. We're on lap number 15, and the uh, pit window will be open midway around this lap, so delayed by one minute as there, diving into turn eight, goes uh, Thomas Neubauer in his BMW, Benjamin Goethe behind him. Drivers ready, teams ready, pit stop activity is imminent. And there'll be some diving in on this lap. So there is Bogoslowski who needs to make progress, but he's got Jordan Pepper still. He's seen the back of that Lamborghini since this race went green and hasn't been able to make a move. And he's got Callum Williams behind him who really does want to get past the Mercedes at the earliest opportunity but uh, probably going to be difficult. There are our lead four, five cars coming through turns 13 and 14. Interesting, though, how Thierry Vermeulen in sixth place has dropped a big chunk of time on just one lap after the restart. And Van Thor comes into the pit lane then, so with 33 minutes to go, in he comes, and that's going to give Niederhauser the lead. Interesting, though, that Van Thor comes in early. I, I'm surprised. I would have thought that they would have kept uh, Van Thor out to the last minute, but maybe they set red seat on, on timing and scoring. They know where that car will rejoin and what they don't want to do is have it rejoin in the middle of, a, of the race of cars that are maybe in, in the 20s or 30s in overall position. So that's a strategic call in my view for the 32 uh, BMW. So down the pit lane then come the Comtu Audis. Nicholas Bart in number 12 for example comes in and he will give that car over to Fred Verbiche. Also in Maxi Martin to give away to Valentino Rossi. So two of the three leading cars in, and that gives Valentino quite a long stint, as it does Charles Wirtz, but there's a plan here, and WRT know all about strategy. 
Well, they got two cars in the pits and the 32 was in first, followed by the 46. So which of the two is going to come out ahead? We wait to see. Oh, and back was wrong with the 32. It's lost a lot of time in that pit stop. It has a big chunk of time. Well, having suggested earlier that WRT might stretch the margin on pit stops, it might have unraveled here. So let's see what that stop time is. But it's not looking great because Ferrari, Lamborghini are ahead. And also the 46 will be well ahead of the 32 BMW as a consequence. And we don't know what the reasons were, whether that was a wheel or it can be much more other than something with a wheel nut, wheel jam, whatever. So Maxi Martin to Valentino Rossi, 64.9 seconds. And then Charles Wirtz, having taken over from Dries Van Thorpe, 1 minute 17. Oh, so you're they've, joking. They have lost 13 seconds, give or take, uh, after all the hard work of Dries Van Thorpe, and that's going to be a bitter pill to swallow, isn't it? Well, I'd like an explanation on that one. And that, I think, is Miguel Ramos, who is desperately trying to cool down. Yeah, I mean, it basically, you just got to get your core body temperature down, take your overalls off. If you've got a, a nice bath, which I hope the team would have for some of the... the, so the, the the, the silvers or the bronzes who are not accustomed to maybe racing at this level in this heat to let them cool down. Core body temperature is something you need to deal with actually quite quickly. Right, the next two BMWs are in. So uh, Thomas Neubauer to give away to Jean-Baptiste Seminar and behind is Cameron Williams in the black and white one and that car now given to Nicholas Crutton. So now you've got the Maxime Martin, Valentino Rossi, BMW coming over the timing line and is the best of the stoppers. So that car is, at the moment, the effective race leader. Now, what a story this will be at Valentino Rossi's home circuit if they could hang on to the lead after all the stops. Well, there's no doubt if that is the case and it goes on to take checkered flag, the fans will be here all evening. Absolutely, and so will he signing autographs. Uh, the other fascination is what Wits can do to fight back. Uh, and also much yellow. So there's a really interesting second stint all of a sudden now as uh, Patrick Niederhauser hustles on in this car that he shares with Owen Bastar, who was last year's GT4 European Series champion. So still learning about GT3. So the lion's share of the work here has to be placed on the shoulders of Niederhauser. Look, all four wheels the other side of the curb so he can then slingshot across the road at turn one. Thierry Vermullen in the second place Ferrari. He is in the pits. And uh, Christian Engelhardt has now been elevated up into second place. Niederhauser's last lap, best of the race. Yep, so clear road ahead without a BMW. Push, push, push. Absolutely, there's an opportunity for Audi to take victory here because if they can get this car in and serviced and back out again, that is going to put them in the pawn seat. A bit. Uh, Bastar will take over. Uh, er Erwan, Erwan, I can't even say it. Erwan Bastar. So it's going to be a big ask for Bastar, but certainly Patrick Niederhauser using the opportunity he's been presented with to very good effect. Yeah, he's trying to give his co-driver the best opportunity. And remember, they started yesterday's race from the back of the grid because of an engine change. They missed qualifying. Uh, so today they've been able to start at the front. Right, over the line goes Valentino Rossi, still the best of the stoppers. And chasing on behind him, look, in the uh, Audi there is Lucas Legere. Now that gap is 3.4 seconds. And Valentino Rossi has just done the car's best lap of the race, quicker than Maxi Martin. That's impressive. That is impressive. Lighter on fuel, but equally we know how good Maxime Martin is. May also be on a new set of tyres. We yeah. don't know whether Martin started on new tyres or not, but certainly it would be probably expected that the second driver would get the benefit of a new set of tyres. Anita Hajar dives for the pit lane and on board with, well, we're not with Raffaele Marcello. We're with, oh, no, we are because they've changed. Yeah. So that car has also come in and changed. And also Giacomo Altre has just set the fastest sector time in sector one now that he's taken over the number 14 Ferrari. And Altway's last lap was even quicker than Niederhauser. So, fastest lap of the race now to Altway. Down the pit lane comes Patrick Niederhauser. Right, Owen Bastar, you are about to have to drive the stint of your life, aren't you, to keep that car up there? It's going to be a tough call, but the order now, as we come to the end of the pit stops, is going to be fascinating with different drivers in the cars, differing pace for some, uh, quicker and slower, depending on who is now behind the wheel in some cases. And in dives with the rear wheels a lot there. 71, Nicola Marinangeli, who was leading earlier on in the uh, contest in silver and then got run out wide now has to fight back so Valentino Rossi keeping the margin over Lucas Legere as away goes Erwin Bastard yes good stop from Santa Log team to get the Audi retained back onto the circuit so here we go again effective race leader Valentino Rossi need to see what his last lap times are to get a feeling for 
his overall pace. Valentino Rossi, the fastest lap of the race. Not for long, Giacomo Altue has just gone even quicker, but I promise you, Valentino Rossi's last lap of a 33.38 was the fastest lap of the race. Didn't even get a time to say wow. <laughs> it went from Rossi to Altue, I mean, in the space of, what, well, nanoseconds, so. Anyway, I mean, what Rossi is doing now is doing what everybody had hoped he would do when he began this four-wheel career last year, and now is really signed up to being a full-time, fully-fledged GT3, BMW, WRT, and our competitor. A 71 five-second time penalty added to the final racing time for track limits infringements. So that penalty we were touching on earlier has uh, now been decided to be a post-race one, as Dennis Marshall in Audi 66 has now done the fastest lap of the race. He's down in 29th place, another of the bronze cars. So Valentino Rossi, the best of the stoppers. There he is, hard at work. There it is, a figure of concentration, leaning his head into the corner. Down at the far end of the circuit, zone, 13, <laughs> I think, and 14. Look at the tension on the faces of the fans. Do they love this, or do they love this? Here he comes, past the busy grandstands. And accelerating again up towards the timing line. So, can we get another fastest lap out of Valle? Let's see, goes over the line, lots of cheers for him. And Valentino Rossi then on that lap, a 33.316, not quite the ultimate fastest, but it's good. And behind him, Lucas Legere is four seconds back. The gap is growing. There, look, you've got Bastar ahead of Simonau, ahead of Altue. And where in all of this is Charles Witt? He is down behind Raffaele Marchiello. So that pit stop at WRT, we need to get to the bottom of because it's really turned the race upside down. They've certainly done that for the 32 BMW. We don't know what the reason was, but clearly, Battle I mean, is getting very close once again as the 25 and the 31 running close together. So Bastar and Simonar. Simonar looking to find a way past down the inside into turn eight, leaving himself vulnerable to the Ferrari who might be undercut coming out of the exit. Yes, it does. Ferrari might get two cars, might only get one. Actually, may not get any as they get into turn nine. So Bastar fends off Seminar to the outside line, goes Altue, couldn't make it stick there. The BMW gets a good line out of the corner, gets the undercut. This is for fourth, fifth, and sixth, and on the inside line now is Jean-Baptiste Seminar. Car 87, car 18, car 68, five-second time penalty added to the final racing time, disrespecting track limits. In the background there, we have what looked like much yellow being crowded to the gravel. Uh, absolutely, I've been well and truly off the racetrack. So that will not do the tyres on his Mercedes much good for a couple of corners. Then they get them cleaned up. But this battle, the BMW, Audi and the Ferrari is... It's getting busy and yeah. it is Bastard just keeping Altue at bay. But Jean-Baptiste Simonau then having gained a place comes up across the timing line. Engelhardt has pitted, Evra has pitted. And so now we have Rossi and Legere, and then this BMW of Simonau as the top three. Bastar in the blue Audi is fourth, Altue is fifth, and Valentino Rossi leads at Masano by four and a half seconds. Not a comfortable lead, but he'll take it. Now, 24 minutes are on the clock. Erwin Bastar trying to protect the place over Altue, Albert Costa catching up behind them. Marcello is 12th, and he's dropped back, having run out wide, or been run out wide. Coming out of turn 10, the Mercedes has fallen back behind Charles Witt. So that is the leader. And we haven't been able to say this terribly often thus far in Fanatec GT. But the race leader, Valentino Rossi, accelerates once more down that back straight. Must get the sweat out of his eyes. He's on lap number 21. And Valentino Rossi carrying on the good work in that first stint by Maxi Martin, and he's getting away because in the first sector he's pulled another half a second over Legere. Yes, four and a half seconds as they came across the line. Here we are down at the far end of the circuit, so this is a bit of lap traffic, so Rossi will want to clear that. We'll be looking for cooperation, whether it will be given or not, but certainly you can see up the inside, think, oh, yes. Well, that was a brave move because I'm not sure the Lamborghini saw it initially, but then it did and it pulled away to let the race leader go through, and that's an important pass at a tricky part of the racetrack. Doesn't it also illustrate how he's come on in 12 months? The confidence he had to do that might not have been there last year. It was not. I mean, when you asked me the question of Brands Hatch, where can he improve, I said everywhere. Since Brands Hatch, there's been a step forward from Valentino Rossi in every phase of his competition. 
with WRT, and that was a good overtake. And uh, he made a stick, and the key was getting it done on turn 16. The final racing time, track limits infringement. So Valentino Rossi with that podium at Brands Hatch in race two seemed to unlock something in the confidence. He's been on the podium at Le Mans in the support race. Punctured tyre for 54 Porsche. So that car is limping back to the pit lane. 54 is the uh, Christian Engelhardt now Adrian Delina entry and it's trying to keep off the line. But interesting that another curb strike possibly as here is the replay of number 32 BMW. So the car comes in and the team go to work. The car goes up on its jacks. And the stop looks OK. So uh, I need to speak to the team and ask them, because they were double stacking again, bringing two of their team cars in at the same time. So uh, the space needed for the 46 would have been determined basically where the 32 would have stopped. There should have been room for both of them to stop and have working room, but uh, maybe there was something in that particular moment. That will be explained later. 4.7 seconds between race leader and leisure in second place. Yeah, I mean, unless they needed to move the car back, but it wouldn't have been up on the jacks so they start the pit stop, unless they then dropped it down, moved it, kind of been in the wrong place. We didn't see that. Let's have a look, as uh, here is Marcello. Now, we saw him in the background being off the racetrack, and the onboard illustrates it does, John. Yes. So, waiting off the exit of turn, just round wide. That's just down to... I have to say, Raffaele Marcia let the car drift too far wide on the exit of turn 10, and the penalty is he went off track. He's up to eighth position. He's got ahead of Charles Vetch, which is actually something I wouldn't have anticipated. So Marcello back at the races and running. Last lap was 134. Uh, I don't know why Vetch has dropped away, because he was ahead of oh, and bodywork. Is that a bit of bodywork came off? Somebody or other, or is it bodywork lying in the middle of the racetrack from a previous uh, incident? I was just wondering whether that incident where Marcello went off the road, had he been run wide by Wirtz, who's given the place back for fear of a penalty to be on the safe side. Might be. There's nothing that's commanded him to do that. And as the team said, it might be worth doing. Yeah, we didn't see, but obviously there's a car on the inside. The camera on board, the 88 Mercedes may not have picked up where the, the BMW was. Maybe that is indeed the reason why 88 went wide. So we're waiting to see if there's any further notifications on that potential situation but Marcello running 2.2 seconds behind Frank Pereira in eighth position. So Valentino Rossi building the lead it was four seconds to change at the start of the stint it was five seconds last time goes across the line that pleases the faithful and Maxi Martin the last man to win a sprint round in a BMW uh, smiles, no doubt, because he might be on for another. Uh, 2015 was the last time a BMW, the Z4, won a sprint cup race. Ewitz looks on, not delighted about the progress of his son's car, down the order now, but pleased that he might be celebrating a win for number 46. Well, it's a team car. Obviously, the 32 was the more likely of the two to win, and that's not going to be the case. So ninth place for Charles Wirtz. Uh, but look, there's still a battle going on. So the 30 BMW... Oop. So that's Nicholas Crutton. He's just got past Fred Vervich. Now he has a go at Yuki Nomoto. So Nicholas Crutton, no respect for reputation, is he? Getting past Vervich, he doesn't like that. Fights back and retakes the place in the Come For You Audi on the inside, going out of turn six. So back into 13th place is Fred Vervich. The pair of them chasing after Yuki Nomoto, who is currently second in silver. And the silver class leader now is Lorenzo Patrese in Audi number 99 once more. Yeah, the consummate professional driver, Fred Vervich, so he never gives up, races to the very last inch, centimetre, whatever, so he's back onto the tail of the Lamborghini and, uh, running at 12. Two, five second time penalty added to the final racing time, track limit infringement. More and more of these track limit infringements with time penalties for post-race. As there, Crutton and Vervich carry on this toe-to-toe -to -toe battle. Vervich, 13th. And he's in the overall class, as it were. Uh, Critton is in gold and leads the Gold Cup. Doesn't necessarily want to get himself in strife, though, does he? He needs to pick his battles. Yes, I mean, his nearest challenger is all the way down, Adam Ateki, in 18th place. So he, is, he doesn't really need to be fighting a car in another class, other than, you know, if you're a racing driver and you see a car ahead of you, it's natural that you want to challenge him. Well, right now, Valentino Rossi has got uh, just over 18 minutes of the race to go, and he's building the gap. It's up to five and a half seconds, and there's nobody lapping 
demonstrably quicker. Uh, he's in the 33s, so is Legere. Everybody else a 34 or slower, uh, unless you go a long way down the order to find Dennis Marshall. So uh, up front is Rossi. Legere is second, Simonau is third. Albert Costa has gained the place. Owen Bastard in Audi number 25, the blue Audi that Niederhauser started. He's fallen back now into sixth spot as here. 163, Yuki Nomoto turns through second in silver, but he's under attack from Fred Vavish. Yeah, but the pace that the Lamborghini has had all weekend has been strong, and we've seen a number of different brands and driver combinations challenge it, but look, Fred Vavish trying, working hard through the exit of 10 to get himself into a position, not to pass there, but maybe make a move coming down the straight through the dog leg down into turns 13 and 14. So it's not close enough, but he can work the Lamborghini hard and think about it. Well, no. So together they come through and a little bit wide goes the Lamborghini there. Yuki Nomoto keeping Vervish at bay. And Nicholas Cruton, having been with them a lap or two ago, has dropped off the back by a couple of lengths. Rossi to Legere. The gap is now 5.4 seconds. That time, fractionally quicker was Legere. Maxi Martin, we understand, is very nervous indeed in the garage. Doesn't want to look at the pictures, doesn't want to talk to anybody, just wants this chequered flag to come out. Look, he's not a TV commentator, isn't he? <laughs> well, he did a great job in his stint, and that slow pit stop for number 32 BMW has uh, dropped Charles Wirtz down to ninth place. He is pushing as hard as he can, but there's something not right there because the pace is, is dropping away from Marcello, who's ahead of him. In bronze, Ancient Gouven in the Porsche is the leader, but Enrique Chavez in the McLaren is his opposition, and there they are together. And I think the McLaren will be a handful for Gouven in the Porsche because all through the season, Chavez has been most impressive, but he also himself, of course, into turn eight, so he's got Gilles Magnus behind and just those three cars. That's Dean McDonald that spun the McLaren by the look of it at turn eight. So we've lost one of the JP Motorsport cars. And the flames coming from the exhaust. That's just a reservoir. I can't see whether it's from the exhaust or coming from under the engine bay. Sometimes if an engine gets shut down very quickly, the residue of fuel in the exhaust system does ignite. You just open the throttles full and then it absorbs all the flame. Anyway, that car is sitting on the outside of turn eight. We wait to see whether it can get going again. Right, for bronze, Gouven leads Chavez. You've got two very accomplished uh, young GT racers here. I entered Gouven as one Porsche Super Cup. He's been uh, a star in one make national championships like Carrera Cup Germany before he came into GT racing, whether it's GT3 or GTE spec cars. And Enrique Chavez, then former Formula Renault single-seater racer, right on his tail behind the pair of them is Gilles Magnus trying to get up the order because he's one of the quick Gold Cup drivers. And look at that, almost pushing the McLaren out of the corner. 69 for track limits infringement. Over the line comes Gouven, over the line comes Chavez. But as long as the McLaren is defending from the Audi, that helps the Porsche. Yeah, but remember that Audi got tagged with another car down at turn 13, 14. Earlier in the race, two cars into one don't go. So let's look and see what can Marcello get through. Well, he's on the right part of the racetrack, but he's getting pinched coming into turn 13, but makes it stick. Goes ahead of front Pereira, up into seventh place. 14 minutes to go. Mello still praying for a safety car, but there's no suggestion of that. Dean McDonald's spin, what he got going again, that was the nearest we had to another interruption. One full course yellow to safety car early on. Gouven versus Chavez for bronze, but it's on track. Chavez versus uh, Gilles Magnus for 20th place. Bronze versus uh, gold there. So in the pseudo golf colours, there is the McLaren out of turn 10. Uh, Rossi, in the meantime, 5.3 seconds up the road. Just out of interest, anybody who cares about the 88 Mercedes, Marcello on lap 27 has just said fastest sector time of all in sector two. So that car has got tons of pace, but unfortunately for Marcello, it's down in seventh position. Yeah, he's holding up to seventh, as we saw when he got past from Pereira. Dennis Marshall, 22nd, is still the man with the overall fastest lap of the race, as Chavez that having taken over from the very hot Miguel Ramos comes rattling over the kerb down towards turn 16. Heads over the timing line. Lead gap down a fraction that time. Five seconds still as Gouven and Chavez go through, still pretty much tied together. This, remember, is for the bronze cup lead. So the, the Porsche, the McLaren, and the Audi. I do if you put Magnus at the front of this group, he would pull away. You put 
the McLaren in the front of the group, he would pull away and now enter traffic, so this is an opportunity but not being able to be seized upon by any of those three battling cars, but looks to me as if just very, very slightly that Chavez benefited out of that moment. You look how close he is to the back of the Porsche coming along the, the turn straight up into turn eight. Magnus also just hanging back, watching and waiting. So there, out of turn eight, goes the bronze battle. Valentino Rossi, five seconds to the good, still leads. Could he be on for his first outright win here in a car race? We've seen him, of course, take a podium at Brands, the class win in the Le Mans Cup race at Le Mans. But uh, comes then on lap 28 over the timing line now, starts lap 29. You're riding still here with Enrico Chavez, who goes from the inside to the outside, trying to get the undercut against Guven. Here it comes, the move on the inside, fantastic! Good pass, well worked, but has he got, he's lost it because the Porsche coming back, almost, almost contact between the two, but to me, absolute great job by Chavez to make that position stick. Now, we're going to see, oh, the Porsche all over the place, Audi gets out, Magnus likewise sees the opportunity. Dennis Marshall also wanted to get rid of the action, getting ahead of the Porsche. So Govan really struggled as it all began coming down the back straight with a great move by Chavez. And unfortunately, unfortunately, Dennis Marshall wasn't able to make it three past the Porsche in one lap. But now you said if the McLaren gets to the head of that group, it will pull away. Well, that now is where Enrique Chavez is. And you can see that he is absolutely storming on. So he leads bronze. He can stay there to win the class, but he'd like to try and gain another scalp or two overall. The next target is Christopher Meese up the road in the Audi, uh, having taken that car over from Gregoire de Moustier. There's second, Lucas Legere. Third, Jean-Baptiste Simonau. Fourth is Albert Costa's Ferrari, ahead of teammate Giacomo Altue. Then you've got the blue Audi, Owen Bastar, sixth. And look how close Marcello is. Yeah, Marcello, I would suggest, we've got just over 10 minutes in this race remaining, possibility to get a top six. Uh, then it's a bit further up the road, uh, Altue. Well, Altue's only a second ahead of Batar in the sixth place up to him. You never know, maybe Marcello could make it sixth, possibly fifth, with 10 minutes to go. So Marcello accelerates then towards the end of the lap, and as they come through there now, we've got just 10 and a half minutes on the clock. So through goes Marcello and Owen Bastar to make the point again in his first season of GT3 racing, adapting well to the greater aero, the greater speed of these cars, but Marciello knows the Mercedes inside out, and it won't be long surely before he lines up to have a move, and it's probably going to come at the end of the back straight that they're approaching down towards turn eight at Quechia. Yes, he's got to do the hard yards at this point on the circuit to get himself into that optimum overtake position. He can't do very much here. He's not close enough to the back of the Audi. He will try and put himself here into turn eight, use what the Mercedes has got, which is fundamentally great car balance, closes up under brakes. Batar doing a very good job driving the car to keep Marcello behind, but from here up onto turn nine, then the exit of 10 onto the back straight. Now, put yourself out wide. Now the potential for the undercut to Cap try and get a better drive, a faster drive off turn 10 than the Audi's doing, and that's been successful. But will he be able to get along side before they get into the kink? Bastard defends, but Marcello is going to line him up, surely. He turned through that right kink, then it's a slightly tighter right, and then a tighter, and then a hairpin. And Marcello unable to make a move as yet. What about now? He's not close enough, is he? Couldn't dive up the inside, so Bastard hangs onto the place, coming out of the uh, turn 14 hairpin. And now back onto the power. Turn 50 towards the end of the lap. Last left-hander up towards the line. Nine minutes to go. Well defended by Bastard to do that, because Marcello is no mean competitor. And uh, he wasn't intimidated, the Batar, that is, wasn't intimidated at all. I mean, just been putting the 88 car into the mirrors of the Audi. And even, even you just how hard that Marcello is having to work himself behind the wheel to keep in contact and not let the Audi just gain that extra half a second or more a lap. Otherwise, his opportunities are going to be effectively with, what, eight and a half minutes to go. That's it. Up front, Valentino Rossi is still five and a half seconds to the good. Legere can do nothing about him, and Valentino has not put a wheel wrong, as far as we know. So he's on target for the win, but what about Raffaele Marciello on target for sixth place? He's right there on the back of Bastar. I was suggesting the move might come here. He closes under braking, but no gap. So it's going to be on the exit of turn 10. So there's the race leader comes through. 
So Rossi goes through five and a half seconds at the start of the lap and he stretched it more in sector one. There in second place, Lucas Legere, having taken over from Christopher Hauser. And then in third place is Jean-Baptiste Simonard in number 31 BMW that he uh, took over from Thomas Neubauer. There it is. Uh, interesting, isn't it? That that BMW just can't do anything about the Audi. They kind of plateaued now, each driver going absolutely flat out. But that BMW third has no discernible advantage over the Audi ahead of it. No, I think, I mean, it's ultimately a bike, you know, track position. And of course, we're getting to the end of the race on the set of rubber that you probably pushed extremely hard on on the opening part of your stint. So everybody's more or less in that similar kind of situation. There's not very much left in terms of overall grip for any of these leading cars. Well, there is the fourth place Ferrari of Albert Costa ahead of Giacomo Altue. Marcello is through, he's done it, he's got by Basta, and now he might get Altue before the end. This is another of those typical Marcello stints, isn't it? Foot nailed to the boards. A Marcello charge. Let's have a look and see, coming out of turn, well, this is on to back straight again. This is the place where he lined up one lap ago. Yeah. Gets himself slightly a better position this time. Just has got a little bit more straight line performance and gets alongside before the king. And that's the deal done. Well, done and dusted and an easy, straightforward pass for the Correction maestro. For 87, the penalty is 10 seconds, not 5. 10 seconds. 87 is Jim Plow and Eric Debard's car, which has got a 10 second penalty for earlier offences. Marcello then chases Altway. He's only 1.6 seconds back. That's on as well before the end. So uh, this, even without a safety car, has been a remarkable stint by Lello. Absolutely, but I think elsewhere will be a slightly more taxing case to find a way around. But he's got the opportunity, six minutes on the clock. And, well, can he close up the gap? That's one thing. Finding a way around will be something extra. Well, indeed, there going through is the number 188 uh, McLaren. And, sorry, the 159 McLaren, Nikolai Kiergaard. 30 is Nicholas Crutzen leading in gold. And behind him is the leading silver car, uh, the Audi Lorenzo Petrezzi. And there, getting into the back of sheer guard, Fred Verviche, who is in a big hurry. Can he go the long way around the outside? No, he pulls back in. But Fred Verviche absolutely using everything he's got with the Audi. Can't do it into turn 16. Always one of the more difficult parts of the racetrack. A yellow flag. And that's in the first sector. So that's happened down at the first corner. It looks like there's a car stranded. Might be the Hexis Porsche, Marco Casara having given it to Stephen Pallette. And there's the McLaren in the background that's been parked for a while. Ah, yes, just off the racetrack. Now, it's on the road, isn't it? It is. Right, yellow flags are waving, but if that car can't restart, you know where I'm heading with this. Yeah, five minutes of the race remaining. Oh, this is going to make them even more tense at WRT. So, for the moment, let's concentrate on this fight where Sheergaard, Verviche, Crutton and Lorenzo Petrezzi, the leading Silver Cup driver are all squabbling. There, Yuki Nomoto's Lamborghini second silver chasing Patrese, but he's got to make up four seconds. That, I don't think, is going to happen before the end unless there's a bit of outside help. Other than wishing and hoping it'll happen, but I think that's too much even for wishing and hoping. Indeed. So the Porsche trying to limp off the circuit. The race director with just under five minutes to go doesn't really want to neutralise the race. He wants that car off the road as there, Nomoto with the... Uh, Lamborghini behind him, a lap down. That's uh, the car delayed early on of uh, Spinelli and Glatzeba. So, we're on to lap number 33. The lead gap still hovering around five seconds as number 77, Jordan Love, goes through. That car that did lead Silver earlier on has dropped to third in class. And they came into this as the category championship leaders in sprint. So, uh, he's under attack as well because Ezequiel Perez Compang is not that far behind. Looking at timing and scoring again, second sector, purple to the 88 Mercedes. This is the 77 Mercedes, which has got Jason Love behind the wheel. Or Jordan Love, I beg your pardon, 77 in 15th place. Perez compact still under yellow flag conditions in sector one, so no overtaking. You're meant to slow down to the pace below the quickest you've been through that sector at any point in the race. And uh, there is the gap closing between 88, closed out pretty quickly, in fact. Yeah, Marcello then has got time left to have a go here at Giacomo Altway, former uh, International GT Open champion. Lamborghini Super Trofeo runner-up, world final winner. Marcello goes wide into turn nine. He wants to get the cut back out of ten. And this is where he lines up, as he's done in the past. Yes, he's using the same trick he used to get past a little bit earlier. So Ferrari has got good straight line performance. He's blocking off, if you wish, the 
inside line through the dog leg. Just you run the outside. Very brave then the cut back. Can he slide up the inside? Wow, well, that's a good bit of uh, not gamesmanship of nothing else, but good race thinking. Racing brain. If you want a racing brain, Marcello is showing you what it's all about. So Marcello then now up into fifth place. Albert Costa is another 3.4 seconds up the road. So that's going to be a big ask in two and three quarter minutes. Valentino Rossi has gone through. Here is the bronze battle for second. Now, I entered Guven with Dennis Marshall in the Audi right up behind him. So the Porsche led early on. Alex Malikin started it. I entered Guven struggling a little bit as the race comes to an end, it seems. And Dennis Marshall, who did have the fastest, still has the fastest race lap, but finding a way around the Porsche, well, has not been an easy job. Again, close through 15 into 16. Will he make a move? No, he's not going to be able to do it there either. So not much chance on the exit of 16 down into turn one because Torino will be short straight. And that flat six aspirin and Porsche Regent still got a lot of grunt. As indeed, as they come down towards turn one then. So Dennis Marshall on the back of Iron Schoen and the Valentino Rossi fan club are starting to celebrate. We've got just under two minutes of the race to go. There he is. The lead gap is still around the five second mark. He has stretched it since the beginning of the stint. Uh, it is hard not to get excited about this. However, a cynical one might be a hardened motor racing fan because here you're watching somebody who has changed disciplines, who has come into a very bright spotlight, into a really tough GT championship, learnt a lot, and here, at his home circuit, where he had three MotoGP successes, he's about to start the last lap. And so, Valentino Rossi accelerates there now, out to turn 16. There's lots of applause for that. He's on his last lap, and a first outright win in a GT car beckons. Superb by the WRT team. Excellent job by Maxime Martin. And, of course, Valentino Rossi, the hero. This local circuit, and the fans are going to go nuts. Are they ever? So, Valentino Rossi it is who leads, and the margin is still five seconds over the opposition as the car works its way onto the back straight for the last time. So, Valentino Rossi, at, as we say, very much his home circuit. He was a winner here in MotoGP in 2008, in 2009, in 2014. That, from memory, was his last uh, motorcycle Grand Prix triumph on home soil. Where better, therefore, than to have his first Fanatec GT win, his first outright win in a race car. He comes out of turn 10, and now Maxime Martin can look at the pictures. Now he can smile, now he can rub his hands together in glee. Valentino Rossi is almost home, comes down the back straight, heads towards Curvoni through the kink, and it's a great sounding car, the BMW, but I fear you won't hear it cross the line for all the cheers. He comes now up towards turn 13, then to the hairpin, the road tightens and tightens and tightens, and then 15 and 16 back and two corners to go before a first win in Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe, powered by AWS Sprint Cup. Maxime Martin started it, Valentino Rossi brings it home for a first ever win and a great reception. Valentino Rossi, Maxime Martin, win at Masano, fantastic drive by both Lucas Legere and Christopher, Me uh, Christopher Hazard, our second, Jean-Baptiste Simonard, Thomas Neubauer, our third. And you can see how much that means to Valentino. Absolutely, you can see the tears in his eyes. He's probably got sweat running down his <laughs> face as well, but that is an extremely emotional day for Valentino Rossi. He has truly now come of age uh, in the WRT BMW team, and even now you can see his the, the, the welling up. Oh, Vincent Voss going to congratulate the engineers that worked with the 46 BMW. There are the fans going absolutely well. You think you're in a football match, or it could be that it's not the, I say it's not the orange army, they, they follow Max Verstappen. This is the yellow army that's following Valentino Rossi. <laughs> well, the Rossi merchandise stand in the paddock has been doing a roaring trade. It might do even better now. I hope he's not got anything booked later on today because he might be here for a long, long time uh, signing autographs. But well done, Valentino Rossi and Maxime Martin, who are victorious in Fanatec GT here at Bassano. Lucas Legere and Christopher Haas are second from Jean-Baptiste Simonard and Thomas Neubauer, Albert Costa and Thierry Verbulen fourth. And fifth, Rafael Marcello and Timor Boguslavski. That's a good result. Very much so, yes. I mean, they were a great recovery indeed. And Rafael Marcello to drag that car up to fifth place. Uh, so just what it just sums up what class is all about. So... 
what a drive and he had to work for that because there was always a concentration level to be maintained and Lucas Legere tried but was never really able to bring down that gap. Well, he's just lo loosening off the shoulder straps you are permitted to do on the slow down lap. I mean, these cars are absolutely boiling inside. Despite of having a, a really efficient air conditioning system in the BMW, that car will be an absolute an oven for every competitor here this afternoon. Look at that. Everybody on their feet as uh, BMW number 46 comes down the pit lane. Just to remind all the Rossi fans, Maxi Martin played a pretty big part in that. It's not all down to Valley, but his teamwork. The key for this win was getting that third position on the grid in qualifying this morning. That was down to Maxi Martin. Yeah. Then Valentino took over the car, having done a great job by Martin. Now, how he gets? Absolutely, no, he hasn't even come into the pit lane. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Let's hope that doesn't contravene a regulation about getting out of the car uh, before you get to Park Ferme. Eh? Uh, it would be uh, very, very harsh if that were to break a rule. So Valentino Rossi then gets back on board. Uh, hopefully, belts will be done up and he'll drive to the pit lane and then more celebrations can take place. So, well done. Valentino Rossi, race winner here. Yeah, he's got the belts done. Good man. Knows what he's meant to be doing. He needs them attached. He must attach those belts to drive back into the pit lane to ensure that when he comes into the pit lane, they are all attached. Then he can release them and enjoy his the greatest moment, one of the greatest moments in his motorsport career. Well, yeah, it's going to be interesting if Gemma gets the chance to ask him where that rates against all of those MotoGP successes because it's been tough. We, we, we've made the point he's always come in to the highest level of GT racing. He could have gone off and done a one-make GT-style championship like Porsche Carrera Cup Italy, for example, like Jorge Lorenzo is doing this year. But no, he's come in in the brightest of spotlights, in the toughest of the best GT competition and around, and now he's a winner. And, now, and you always threw me the toughest questions, my Valentino. <laughs> I'm the one who's going to, you know what, with my nose, you know what. Anyway, what a great day for Valentino Rossi. What a great day for his fans here at Mazzano, the circuit that he knows it's his backyard. And look again, the, you can see his eyes welling up, sweat as well, running into his eyes and just thinking, I wonder what he's thinking. I wonder what his thoughts are. I, I've got an idea. I'm not saying it because it will be a deeply emotional one that he will be thinking about right now. Well, in a moment, once the car arrives where it's meant to park, we'll uh, start to see how much it all means. And uh, Valentino Rossi, when he gets out of the car, I hope Gemma's got sharp elbows because she's going to have to fight her way through to the front of the queue, I think, to go speak to the doctor and he comes towards the Park Ferme area. You can hear all the cheers in the background. This could be the longest podium ceremony ever. So uh, the BMW tries to nestle its way down to the winner's arch. A WRT winning car is nothing new, but this one is Maxi Martin and Valentino Rossi win at Masano. <laughs> There's moments like these and you think of all the hard yards that every competitor has had to go through that make your competition life so wonderful. Look at that. Look at that. I mean, that is absolutely pure, unadulterated joy, isn't it? There's nothing phony about that. Look how much it means to Valentino Rossi, to Maxime Martin, and to them, all the fans. Maxime Martin is not unused to winning GT races, but this is pretty special. Oh, and there's no doubt being a partner of Valentino Rossi in Mazzano, his home racetrack. It is a moment for Maxime Martin. It's not quite the same as winning at Spa for Maxime Martin, but this is let me, Valentino Rossi's Spa victory at Mazzano. So, somewhere in all of that is a, a very happy WRT team. Of course, it could have been a slightly different result, but for the poor pit stop for Charles Witt, Street fan for, and uh, elbows out. Gemma's trying to get between the throng of photographers and the team personnel. And uh, we'll hear from our winners as soon as we can, I promise you, once Valentino Rossi takes off his helmet. And uh, everybody wants to say well done, including Jean-Baptiste Simonard and Thomas Neubauer. So, come on, Valentino, take the helmet off. We want to see the smile. It's going to go probably the, the width of Italy, this smile. Well, I, I wonder when he takes it off how much water is going to come out of the helmet because I have no doubt that that was a hard race for Valentino. So... Wearing a, long, a full face helmet for all this time, and you're out of a car. <laughs> Look, he's going absolutely. Well, he's on. He's on. He's on overdrive. He's on yeah. cruise control. So.
So Valentino Rossi then celebrates, 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 helmet off, and wait to see this smile. Right, Gemma is down there, joining in the celebrations. Go for it, Gemma. Get your elbows out, he's all yours. Maxime Bully, Vincent Voss celebrating as well. It's a wonderful, wonderful atmosphere. This is just incredible. I'm going to try and get Valley first if I can. A home win, your first win in this category. Come on, and where does that rate go? <laughs> Congratulations, buddy. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so we know that we can go, go make a, a good race, but P1 is P1, you know. It's completely well, right? different at the feeling. Yeah. I'm very, very happy. And also Misano is special. And where does that Thank rate on the BMW. scale of all your races? The BMW, all the team, Max, all the guys. Yeah. <laughs> Max, Max, you couldn't watch. You said to me in the garage, I know he's going to do it, but I cannot watch. No, I can definitely not watch. And uh, it's an amazing feeling for him to win here in his home race. And uh, for us to win this... Yeah, first victory of the season, it's, it's amazing. Congratulations, really great atmosphere down here too, well done. It's not often you get a hug from the winner, Gemma, and people would pay good money for a hug from Valentino Rossi. Never wash again, you can sell that. <laughs> well, I think that was a very special moment indeed for Gemma Scott and for uh, Valentino Rossi. Look, you can see, I mean, all the, the build-up over the previous year and a half to reach the point where you win a race on merit, which is what the 46 BMW has done here this afternoon. Fantastic. Just brilliant. Just brilliant to see. Uh, and uh, where better, as we say, than his home circuit. Right, so Valentino Rossi and Maxi Martin win at Masano from Lucas Leger and Christopher Hauser. And then Jean-Baptiste Simonar and Thomas Neubauer come home in third. Raffaele Marcello and Timor Bogoslavski finishing in fourth place with uh, Albert Costa and uh, Thierry Vermeulen given a penalty. They drop to fifth ahead of Altway and Lapalainen in sixth spot then is the second of the Emil Frey Ferrari, seventh to Owen Bastar and Patrick Niederhauser, ahead of Front Pereira and Jordan Pepper. Only ninth after that slow pit stop, Charles Wirtz and Dries Van Thul, they never really recovered from that, suggesting there was more to it. And then in tenth, Nikolai Schiergaard and Benjamin Goethe, retiring yesterday with damage, but a top ten finish today, a good result. Gold won 12th overall by Nicholas Critton and Callan Williams. Silver, Lorenzo Petresi and Alex Arca taking the honours there. And in bronze, second win of the weekend for Enrique Chavez and Miguel Ramos. Now, uh, it is a silver win for Alex Arca and Lorenzo Petresi. It was a tough start to the weekend yesterday. Lorenzo put it in the gravel, but a win to round out the weekend. They were Gemma. Lorenzo, a class win at a home race. That's got to mean a lot to you. Yeah, it's very nice. I mean, it's been a difficult weekend. We had the pace, but never really could put it down. Uh, and yeah, race two was amazing. The team did an amazing job at the pit stop. Alex, uh, just uh, managing at the start of the race was not easy. We also had some damage in the front, but uh, yeah, we managed really happy, really happy. Congratulations. Well done to you. Thank you. Yeah, Lorenzo Petresi is coming on as a GT driver nice and impressively. OK, he made that mistake yesterday, but he's just getting on with the job and delivering good results. Well, he's going to be a major force come year upon year upon year. He showed natural speed. Look, here's go back to Valentino Rossi and just these slow-mo images of the BMW M4. And it's been a great weekend. A superb drive yesterday to finish third by Dries Van Thor and Charles Betts coming for, again from a long way back to finish in the 32 BMW, but here victory today for the 46. And this will be a seminal day in this location. Well, a really impressive job done by Valentino Rossi and Maxime Martin. Winning margin, 4.2 seconds. Valentino backed it off on that last lap to make sure he brought it home safely. And uh, all of those people have had quite a day, haven't they? They've seen their hero win, and uh, what a result. Well, there'll be many, many people here who will go away and in years to come tell their grandchildren, I was at Mazzano the day Valentino won his first four-wheel motorsport competition. So they will go to the podium and the celebrations will be long and loud, that is for sure. Good drive by Marcello. Absolutely. I mean, what you'd expect from Marcello. I mean, what he did was overtake extremely well. We saw that on, on, on Altre and likewise on the on the Audi as well. Finding a way to get around a car, not necessarily because his car was quicker, but because he used his car in a more effective, efficient manner. So the overall podium is underway, and Jean-Baptiste Simonard and Thomas Neubauer are on their way 
to the third step. Then for second place, making their way to the podium, is going to be the Audi team of Lucas Legere and Christopher Hauser. Now where have they gone? They're lurking behind the podium somewhere. Well, I think now they are being called forward. So the Audi drivers from the Comtu team, Christopher Hauser, Lucas Legere, step forward. And uh, a good result. Christopher Hauser, like many of the Audi sport drivers, wondering where his career goes next because of the uh, changes to Audi's customer racing program for the future. There are going to be a lot of drivers looking for drives. And so there's here the uh, BMW WRT representatives given the regulation hats. They will be ushered on for the winning team, WRT. And there is no doubt about the race winners at Masano. Maxime Martin and Valentino Rossi. So the cheers are long and loud. And uh, so the drivers now head to the podium and the national anthem for the winning driver. Valentino Rossi is still celebrating and he will do so for hours, won't he? That was some drive. And uh, as the drivers on the podium now receive their trophies from Daniel Ruderman from AWS, they go to the third paced WRT crew, John Baptiste Simonau and uh, then Thomas Neubauer with him. Valentino busy celebrating, just waiting to get the trophy for second place there, Lucas Legere and uh, Christopher Hauser. Then WRT as the winning team gets the team's trophy. And then the trophy to Maxime Martin. And the trophy to the man of the hour, to Valentino Rossi. They've been in the heat all day. That has made it worthwhile, hasn't it? So fantastic result. There's probably nowhere better for Valet to have that first car win than Masano, than his home circuit and just listen to that reaction. <laughs> so they huddle together for photographs. There are more people in the race than Valentino Rossi, but many of them are uh, completely immaterial to the Rossi fan club right now, that's for sure. The champagne is ready, and Valentino is the first with the fizz as he sprays anybody and everybody. what has been probably a really high-pressure stint. Understandably, he's eager to let off steam and to celebrate. So a top job done by Valentino Rossi and by Maxime Martin, who, of course, set him up nicely with that great first stint. It's all been about one man, though. Valentino Rossi takes a first car race win. Might be the first of many. Now that confidence is up. We'll wait and see from a very hot Masano, where the celebrations are underway. From Gemma Scott, John Watson and David Addison, thanks for your company. It's goodbye from Italy.
So with all the cheering going on still for Valentino Rossi, there are, of course, three more podiums, gold, silver and bronze, to rattle through. Uh, there's also another race about to start, but rather <laughs> frustratingly for the Renault drivers who are next, uh, there's relatively little interest in them. So uh, the Clio race may have to be uh, put back uh, just while the pit lane is cleared so that the uh, celebrations for the three classes can be completed. And uh, I don't think anybody would begrudge Valentino Rossi his long moments in the sun, would they? So now the uh, podium is being started for gold. And that means that Kenny Hutchison and Gio Magnus are there for third for second in the class come the drivers of the Whoops and VDS, Audi Adonetecchi and Cesar Galzo, and the gold win again for WRT, Nicholas Critton and Callan Williams step forward onto the top step. And uh, that's a very good result indeed, illustrating how the BMW has really been a force to be reckoned with this weekend. And Nicholas Crutton and Callum Williams celebrate Gold Cup success. So the uh, trophies come. Daniel Ruderman. And they go to the third place drivers, Shield Magnus, Finlay Hutchison on the left as you look. Then in the middle of the winners, the trophies to the second placed crew, Adam Matecki and Cesar Gazzo, who got tangled up a little bit with their teammates as we saw early on, and there was that spectacular incident. And there the final trophies to the Gold Cup winners, Nicholas Critton and Callum Williams. So happy drivers uh, are there for the photographs. And WRT's team rep joins for the photographs as well. And uh, drivers getting ready with the champagne. Gilles Magnus has a glint of devilment in his eye. Finn Hutchinson's ready with the bottle as well. So again, good racing in the classes. So much of that race, of course, revolves around Valentino Rossi, but uh, uh, great racing in the classes as well. Incident involving number 12, the Vevish and Bart Audi in the pit is under investigation. Celebrations then for the Gold Cup winners, Nicholas Critton and Callan Williams. Celebrate honours here. So... The champagne is sprayed. We may not get to see the bronze podium, but the silvers are imminent. They will be called forward in a moment. Trophies and champagne prepared for the next sextet of drivers. Excellent stuff by Callum Williams and Nicholas Critton. New combination working together. A, uh, uh, a new partnership for this year. Delivering the goods, and of course, in one of the top teams, WRT. So the Silvers should be next, where we have about to be brought forward the uh, third place team. Yes, it's Alman Alcleo and his Equio Paris Compank take uh, third. Second place to the VSR Lamborghini partnership of Yuki Nomoto and Mattia Michelotti. Another combination of drivers new this weekend because Nomota had uh, Rolf Inaiken with him at Brands Hatch but uh, Mattia Michelotto joining this weekend and then the class winners Lorenzo Patrese and Alex Arca step forward up to the podium they come and uh, a very happy Lorenzo Patrese that sort of puts away all the dramas of yesterday when he put the car in the gravel on his first qualifying lap and had to start at the back of the grid. A silver win to round out Alex Arca and Lorenzo Patrese's weekend. So there will be the uh, national anthem for the winning team for the German Trezor Attempto Racing Squad.
Congratulations to Lorenzo Patrese and Alex Arca. And what a weekend it has been in Fanatec GT World Challenge Europe powered by AWS Sprint Cup.